speaking with a student. After the presentation, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you have difficulty hearing during the program, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers who will assist you. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Associate Director Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you, Keisha. This is her first time. You did well. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics for tonight's lecture, Unmasking the Spy Intelligence Gathering. Tonight's interview will be conducted by Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey. Before I continue, I want you to just take note on the back of your program. Just want to have you look at the War of 1812 on the home front. And that's part of our Fort Leavenworth series, a very popular series. Also, the 2018 Dole Leadership Prize. I think most of you know, but for those that don't, I want to remind you it is Wednesday, November the 7th. That's a program you will not want to miss. Also, for someone who says, what is on the front of your T-shirt? So those of you who may not know, It says Jayhawks engaged, and that's part of our civic engagement and our leadership, uh, KU leadership program. And we're in the middle of working on Get Out the Vote, GOTV, and we have it on 12 different locations in Kansas uh, on our campus. I will continue with the rest of our program. Tonight's guest, is a 35 year veteran of the United States national security community. A former CIA official, he was a clandestine service officer and a Senate liaison for the five directors of central intelligence. He went on to serve on Capitol Hill as intelligence counsel for Senate majority leaders, Bob Dole and Trent Lott. He maintains his involvement with intelligence matters as a member of various advisory groups, both inside and outside the government. He is currently a professor of intelligence studies and chairman of the intelligence program at the Daniel Morgan Graduate School of National Security in Washington, DC. He is also an instructor at Johns Hopkins Krieger School and with the Intelligence and Security Academy. I would like to ask you, to please give our guest this evening a very warm welcome, Ron Marks. Ron, thank you very much for coming tonight. tonight, tonight. Let's start with uh, getting some basic information so our, uh, our folks that know who you are. Sure. Talk a little bit about your education and your upbringing. Well, I was just telling a few people before, I, I grew up in a small town outside of Portland, Oregon. It was called Gresham, Oregon. It's about 4,000 people when I first grew up there. It's all suburbs now, by the way. They paved the darn thing over. It's about 100,000 people there now. But uh, it was it was a lot of fun growing up. Uh, my parents uh, were both political animals. My mother had worked for Hubert Humphrey in uh, Minnesota and uh, met my father out in Portland, Oregon. Dad had come from Massachusetts on his way to Japan, long story for that, but he decided to settle out there. And um, he, was, um, he was a Kennedy Democrat from those days. Oh, don't worry, he became a Nixon Republican later on. But, uh, and it was a house full of politics and it was a house full of news and newspapers. And uh, very early in the game, I got the bug and uh, Finally, my father decided uh, enough of hearing about me, he actually brought me back on a trip to Washington. And there are several things I discovered. Number one is I wanted to be there, just wanted to be there. I can remember riding down from the Capitol Hill Club to back to what was in the Statler Hilton, uh, Capitol Hilton now, thinking to myself, I gotta be here, watching the kid play baseball on the, on the lawn. Um, and the other one is if you're going to be in a place in the world at that moment, especially in the 70s and early 80s, um, when you had Ronald Reagan uh, producing a whole different world, a whole different approach, 
why wouldn't you want to be there? And so I was drawn to politics. I was working on uh, my degrees in economics. I tried law school for a year, failed miserably. Sorry about that. Uh, but I married one. So I guess that makes up for it a little bit. <laughs> Uh, but I uh, was working my doctorate in economics, and um, someone said, and I advise you young people out there, when someone says something, to give it a shot. Never say no. Someone says, I understand that CIA is hiring economists. Would you be interested? To which my response was, sure. Not having anything else to do at that moment. My girlfriend had just dumped me. I was sitting there trying to write my master's thesis. It was all, all pretty much open. So I trundled across to the library. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the University of Oregon campus where I was working on my doctorate, it appeared in a movie called Animal House. I can point out every single building in that movie. And it was only filmed, by the way, a couple of years before I was there. Uh, someone said it was a movie, not an instruction manual, but it'd be a hard place to tell at the time. So I went over to the library and I looked up the CIA address, CIA 20505. Was the that's all the address Washington DC 20505. If I know how many times I was going to write that in the next 30 years of my life, but at the time I looked at it, it really, yeah. and I went back to my room, warm room, right? To the room, and I sat in front of, and, and this is for the, the young people out there, something called a typewriter, um, which had onion skin paper in it because I was a lousy typist. And I just wrote him a note. And I said, look, I'm you know, working on my master's in economics. Seriously, I'm interested in international politics and politics in general. And I popped that 20 cent stamp on that thing and I put it in a mailbox, which you can see in Animal House. Box. That mailbox, you remember where Niedermeyer is on the horse and he gets hit in the head with a golf ball? Well, if you look right through that favorite field on the other side, there's that, there's that post office box. So they sent me um, a letter back, said, you know, would you be interested? So it took about a year of going back and forth and taking a polygraph, which was never a lot of thought of thought of thought of thought of confessors and then back when Ben said he kidnapping and, um, and or the murders rather and the Lindbergh kidnapping. But I got through uh, and about a year and some odd, just about typical of the process. And then in October of 1983, I'm trying not to sound like the military, but I just forgive me. Three October 83 is when I entered on duty. Um, and I walked across the Great Seal at CIA. And I don't know what to say. The odds apparently were one out of 10,000 for those who came in. Now, one never knows where the other 9,999 were. So who knows? Could be some people hanging out in a, in a you know, back of a trailer somewhere in a, in a riverbed. But I, I entered on duty in what was called the career training program, which essentially was their junior officer program. I was one of a number of people uh, who, after 35 years, I still see on occasion. Who were part of that organization. Um, during that training program, I met my wife. And, uh, my wife is the, the real CIA hero here. She spent 34 years at the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, she was an attorney. She won the Career Intelligence Medal for her service as an expert on counterintelligence. Now that she's home for a couple of years, she's been practicing all of that on me. Uh, so I'm happy to be here in Kansas. Uh, actually, not, not true, but she, is, uh, she had a marvelous career. And one of the delightful parts about us uh, meeting uh, there is that it was nice to have a partner who understood what you were doing. Uh, it is very intense work. Uh, occasionally it was dangerous. I must admit, I lived in a different time. Uh, the rules were a little more simple then. Uh, the kids who join now, it's a much different game, a much more dangerous game. Uh, but I found it a most fulfilling and rewarding career. After 16 years of service, uh, I had an opportunity to do some other things, and I took that up. But uh, I stayed there uh, as an advisor. I was just in the building a few months ago. Um, they're all younger now. I don't know how that happened, uh, but they're, uh, and they're all look like they're, you know, bright and ambitious and, uh, and you know, God bless them. Because I like to see them bright and ambitious because they, um, they serve our country well. I mean, for the most part, a lot of what you see in the press, or a lot of what you see in politics, we're all, if you're involved with this institute, you know how politics work. So sometimes there's controversy or people will get on the wrong side of things. But let me assure you of one thing. I don't think there's a person in that building 
even on their worst day, who does not know uh, that they're serving their country, uh, trying to keep their country safe. But that's sort of a long-winded answer, I'm afraid, but uh, that's what I got. Oh, that, that was great. Let's start with a really, another really basic question. So we're all operating off the same basis of information. Exactly what is intelligence gathering? Well, believe it or not, you do it every day. And I knew that thing before, but let's see how we do it here. Because I think I know exactly what I'm going to do. How's that sound? Can you hear me? All right. Sounds like an old Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? Um, we do it every day. Um, what intelligence is about is about the collection of information. It's about collating that information, some sensible piles. It's about reading through or understanding that information and being able to, quote unquote, analyze that information. Uh, and then in turn, being able to present that information to people to make a decision on. It. We're all policymakers. Anybody ever buy a car in this place? All right, what'd you do? You go on the net nowadays and look up the Kelly Blue Book, but you see a blue book and now it's on the net. You ask your friends. So you've done open source research. You do human intelligence. You ask some people. You might not tell them you're buying a new car. You might actually go into a showroom and look around a little bit. Uh, listen to television, listen to radio, look at the net. Well, there's signals intelligence right there. Stare at some pictures. There's some imagery intelligence. And then you make a decision based on that information. Now, the challenge of any intelligence business, of course, is no matter what kind of great intelligence you gather, there's some fool on the other side who ultimately has to act on it, and they may not listen to your brilliance, uh, including yourself sometimes. But that's really the essence of intelligence. And I, I think one of the one of the things you get into in this age is there's there's a lot of focus on given intelligence. Look, James Bond is a human intelligence officer. I got that. Based on Ian Fleming, who is a human intelligence connection in the Office of Naval Intelligence with the British, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of emphasis on the on that kind of spy game. Uh, the spy games nowadays, however, involve a lot of cyber world. Now, I always like to say cyber because silence falls over the crowd. First of all, let me explain to you in Washington, D.C., a cyber expert is someone who can spell the word cyber with a Y. So I'm already ahead of the game. And second of all, just remember that in the Internet age, the Internet is the access through which we obtain information. And cyberspace is essentially all of that information. And, you know, whatever huge numbers there are, it's everything from a picture of Aunt Martha's cat through, you know, some secret installation in the, in the west of China. And that has really become a battleground now uh, in terms of intelligence, in terms of gathering that information, um, in terms of manipulating that information. There is in the bones of the Russian being, uh, I've worked the Russians for a long time, you don't live in a controlled society without knowing that information is power. You control that information. You spin that information. You change that information. And the, it's relatively inexpensive to do. And if you're Russia, that's what you do. So there's a whole other dimension to this game now that I didn't have to play that has added a whole other dimension to intelligence. I'm part of it, frankly, and I can reach in for it right now, but my iPhone is in my pocket. Uh, James Clapper, tired, he and I worked for him, uh, said it's both the most positive and most dangerous weapon in the world. And he's absolutely right. This day and age, that information is in front of you all the time. It pours over you. And you don't always have a chance to make judgments about it. And if you're in the old spy game, where in fact intelligence is about making sense of information, it's overwhelming. And I will tell you that that no matter what you talk to, any analyst you talk to, any operations person, any policymaker, we're all overwhelmed. Some of it's generational, and I think the younger people will have a better shot because just. Those of us who are still in some policy positions and trying to work with this stuff, it's like being in a batting cage that's set slightly too fast. And that ball comes in and you're going to swing at it as best you can. That makes the intelligence game harder than it ever was. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, talk to us about the main components of intelligence gathering. You have field work, you have analysts. Just kind of do a little primer on it for us so we kind of know the key roles. Well, let me, I'll, I'll go right back to old James Bond there. Um, first of all, James Bond never had to fill out a government report. Uh, he never really had to explain to people why the things that he used in the field didn't work. 
uh, or did work. Uh, he certainly had a, an interesting travel budget. Um, he was someone who was obviously into covert action, blowing things up a lot. And he certainly apparently never filed any paperwork with regards to interaction with the local natives in one way, shape or form, uh, which can get you fired in real life. What intelligence is about is that it is ultimately about the collection of information and the sense making of that information. So you have human intelligence officers who go out in the field and collect information. And that's the spy. When you hear spy, CIA refers to them as case officers. That's exactly what it is. You're handling a case. Those people who are spying for you are assets. Those people who are gathering information for you. Uh, your job as a case officer is to handle a number of these people and to try to make sense of what it is that they've said. You write that up and send that back into headquarters where someone will review it. Uh, they will take a look at it and see if it makes sense from their end. And at that point in time, they're beginning to mix and match with other bits of information. Then they, in turn, make it available for analysts on a given area uh, or not. They may just simply put it out there and see who can use it. Uh, the analyst's job is to sit at their desk, something I failed at miserably for a year. Um, I did okay at it, but I put on about 15 pounds, and it wasn't fun. I don't sit on desks very well. It was a very challenging job. I mean, you have to sit and have a lot of information to get to you. And again, you have to make sense out of it so that you can sit across from someone like, say, Senator Dole, or you can sit across from the director of intelligence, uh, the head of the director of intelligence, or you can sit across from a senator, or you can sit across from whoever a general, whoever would be a policymaker. And by the way, it works the same way in the private sector too. I ran Oxford Analytica. I have to repeat Oxford Analytica in Washington for about six years. And we sell intelligence to people in private sector business because they have to make decisions. And your job as an analyst is to gather that information together and do the second part, which is not always natural to the beast, which is explain in an articulate fashion why you believe what it is that you believe. And then the worst part, except for the fact that whoever you speak to at that moment may not be interested in what you have to say, or they may have a different viewpoint. Uh, that's one I can think of most recently. It's a little old now, but it's been talked about. Uh, is uh, Vice President Cheney disagreed violently with the intelligence community over some of the things in Iraq. Uh, he had different sources of information. Uh, that, by the way, is an interesting part now of being an intelligence officer. Now, once upon a time, this is about secrets. Um, secrets were a big portion of the information that you needed to get. Now there's a lot of information that's open. And when you have an internet that connects about 4.1 billion people, you have access to a lot of different people. So what you find now are policymakers, while they're always willing to listen to the secret information, oftentimes will have information of their own. And so you have to make the case that what you have written about makes sense. You're always questioning, you would hope, the underlying assumptions of what it is that you're putting forward. And again, I, I will point you to the case of Iraq, um, the uh, second Gulf War, where in fact one of the big debates at the time was, was you know, what kinds of weapons of mass destruction did Saddam Hussein have? It was a big whiff on the intelligence community's part because they didn't question their underlying assumption. The underlying assumption was that he had something. That, by the way, goes back to intelligence gathering. How much information do you have to make a decision? Think about your own lives. We've all made decisions where we've sort of fanned the gun because we had to make it fast, time pressure. We had to make it it's going to be costly. We've had to push ahead. We have troops in the field, et cetera, et cetera. And that sometimes drives decision making and not in, in not in good ways. Never mind the bias, but just you know, the time pressure and other pressures involved. So what you find in the intelligence business, I think, the, the standards have always been there. So you've got to collect, you, you've got to have someone who can manage these sources and mix and match them and analyze and ultimately present to someone. But your job as an intelligence officer always always try to make sure that you represent an unbiased source of information to whomever that is. Um, I am well acquainted, I might as well just jump on the topic, I'm well acquainted with some of the people who've made some public statements recently about the president. I've known some of them for 30 some odd years. 
And as much as I love them all dearly, and I even went to so far as to sign a petition in support of John Brennan, because he has a right to say this kind of stuff, I would have loved to, and I think we'll get this on the record, this will be nice when it gets back to Washington, I would have loved to pour a sack of cement down his throat to shut him up. <laughs> because what happens in that point is an issue that is near and dear within intelligence, and that is the politicization of intelligence. Everybody's got a viewpoint. The question is to make sure that people understand that your viewpoint is not clouding your analysis. And even if you are a former whatever, and I think we've forgotten a lot about that, that presentation, the idea that you would have a political over political viewpoint is fine as a citizen, that's great. But you gotta remember from whence you're coming. I, I, there's another Kansan who I work for, and who I admire a lot, his name is Robert Gates. And I love Bob Gates. I really do. He gave me a break in my career and he was a great man. And when Bob, I listened to him very carefully. And when he says, be quiet, as he did, you be quiet. Because what it does, it takes away your credibility, the community's credibility. And that is also a tough game to play in an era where people want to talk. This is not what it was back 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, as evinced by my standing here. But also you have people now who wish to get on the air, or wish to get their book out, or wish to, and that's and that's fine. It's America, it's capitalism, it's it's you know freedom of speech, et cetera. But sometimes you gotta watch out what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people forget that sometimes. But uh, uh, let's go on. Let's talk a let's talk a little bit, Ron, if I could get you what are some of the uh, less known about roles. And intelligence. We we you know we know about the the James Bond guys. You know I'm not sure any of those actually exist, but somebody does black ops or something like that. Sure. We know about the analysts, but what are some other roles that we may not know about that are still critical? Well, since 9/11, the, the game has changed a lot. Um, what you had in the pre 9/11 period was was a definitive separation between foreign and domestic. Um, you weren't spying on U.S. soil. Uh, whatever movies you saw or whatever else, forget it. That ended in the early 1970s. There are two Senate, or the House and Senate Intelligence Committee. There are all kinds of oversights on that. When 9-11 happened, one of the reasons it happened, I call it a structural intelligence failure. It's not about dumb people. It's just simply that the information that needed to be there wasn't there. Not unlike with President Roosevelt at Pearl Harbor. He didn't have anybody collecting intelligence for him, essentially. It all ended up in his inbox, and he had to make sense about it, which is why you created a CIA. 9-11 uh, brought forward the idea that there are no there are no domestic and foreign troubles here. They're one and the same. Uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS do not have a domestic and international desk. Uh, they operate in all territory. And so I think what you started to see was the beginning of some develop interesting developments in terms of kinds of jobs. Um, targeters. Uh, the term that people think about, oh, I mean, you're going to put a missile on target to a bad guy. As targeters are about understanding who these people are that we're looking at and gathering information on. The job that I used to do in the field and was done by maybe one person at headquarters or two, you're now subdivided. And those young people stick through the information, not only of the secret, but also of the unclassified. To try to determine maybe who these people are, who they're related to. Uh, the $10 term for it is human terrain. Uh, you know, why when you walk into a village, uh, I mean, I'm an old movie guy, so there's a great old Spencer Tracy film called Bad Day at Black Rock. Uh, you walk into that town and you're trying to figure out who hates whom and why they hate them and who they're talking to. That's human terrain. Those people now exist and they didn't before. Uh, we have uh, throughout the United States now um, almost 100 so-called fusion centers. Uh, these are where analysts come together uh, from CIA, from, uh, from uh, the state, uh, local authorities. Why? Because the cop in the field, the first responder, may be the first one to find out what's going on. Uh, it was a cop that figured out uh, in Times Square that someone was had left a bomb there. Uh, those guys need to be informed. There's tons of information out there, but the ability to get it from Washington out to the field, and by the way, God forbid the information from the field being important and getting it back to Washington, but a hard mechanism. So these fusion centers with CIA and, and, and FBI analysts, along with state and local authorities have been set up. 
through Homeland Security. A whole new bureaucracy set up. Uh, the emphasis, I think, uh, in the training of the FBI, FBI was a white collar crime organization. It did counterintelligence work. Uh, it busted spies. Uh, that after 9 11 turned them upside down. Uh, they have one of the larger contingents uh, of intelligence analysts in the community now because they need to know what information is being collected domestically. Um, once upon a time, when I was looking for information on organized crime for the Bureau, I had to go to files, case files. You guys are lawyers with guns. They're making cases. Uh, now you have analysts who understand the threat uh, within and without the U.S. And can, and can draw on this information and provide analysis, provide support to state and local tribal and territorial law enforcement authorities. That ain't easy. One of the one of the challenges on this is lies in um, uh, lies in the fact that you know we have a constitution uh, that is devoted to making sure that we have a separation of powers and that those powers are co-equal and counterbalanced with each other, passing effects in given areas. One of which, by the way, is in law enforcement. There are 17,000. I should remember the number. 17,965 state local, tribal, and territorial law enforcement authorities in the U.S. There are 46 in Britain. Every time someone gets around to saying to you that we need an MI5 in this country and all that, feel free to hit them in the head for me. They don't get it. They're, they are subjects. The queen who has been anointed by God. Okay? People forget that. And it's Elizabeth II by the grace of God. When she goes through her ceremony, she was anointed. But we are citizens. That means we are equal to our government. Our rights are to be held inviolate. And one of those rights, where people get a little bit nervous, is what police can hang on to and can't hang on to, which runs right up against the problem of terrorism. Terrorism is much more like law enforcement work than it is like old-fashioned old spy work. Yeah, a little bit of both. The kind of granularity of information that you need to make a case for someone or hang on to that information for a period of time doesn't always lend itself for people feeling comfortable about their work with the police. NSA, for instance, is another, another whole new field. It's been data management. NSA has three billion and a half dollar data storage centers if you've ever been in one of these things that they all look like uh, indiana jones when you sort of walk in and down the hall and there's there's nothing but servers on left and right stacking up information primarily out of their files and other files etc but the idea was you know what happens if you have something like the sarnaya brothers in boston it's five years since they went to Chechnya until they came back to do something. How long do you hang on to this information? What do you do with it when you got it? Who controls it? Who oversees this? Uh, the privacy business has gotten very much involved uh, with intelligence now. Um, uh, it's, it's been interesting to watch uh, as the amount of information has expanded, how simply expensive the IT business has become within the intelligence community. Chief information officers matter now. Um, why? Because there's an enormous amount of this data. It's very expensive. Um, it supports the mission. You want people to have that information. But again, that's a title that I would say to you 10 to 15 years ago did not exist. Uh, you know, young people come to me and say, well, what can I do in intelligence? And they always have this, this slight bond thing in mind. And that's fine. Well, I, look, I would never, I had a wonderful career there. Good Lord. I mean, you know, for kids from Gresham, Oregon, they, they, this was a heck of a thing. Um, I would never discourage anybody from it, but there are a lot of different roles to be played and a lot of different careers that are available. And I, and I welcome people to look at some of those websites, and CIA or DNI, Director of National Intelligence, whatever else, and FBI, and see what's available. There are all kinds of jobs now. In your uh, book that you published in 2011, you express that people should have some concerns about how much domestic intelligence gathering is, is going on. Address that a little bit, Ron, and what are those concerns? And as citizens, how concerned should we be about the possibility that our civil rights or civil liberties, I should say, are being abused by the NSA or some other spies? 
Yeah, I, I wrote it at the time in part because I was concerned and, and remain concerned over the fact less that they're doing it than how much oversight of it that we have. Um, I don't, if it, if it is a political decision that we've all decided that we're comfortable with them collecting this kind of information, whatever that may be, uh, then that's fine. Someone better explain it. Someone better explain why. And then someone, frankly, needs to conduct oversight to keep an eye on it. Um, I think in the, in the case of NSA, which obviously the whole Snowden issue just exploded, um, NSA was not an agency that's used to dealing with the public. It is a little more now, uh, but it was an, it was a collection agency. What it did was it collected information, and it was used to doing that and doing it very well. And by the way, it had all the permissions from the Congress and all the permissions from the Justice Department to do all this stuff. But you know, as one of my friends said, there's the court of law and then there's the court of public opinion. And the problem was when Snowden came out, it was a big burst at one time. Oh my God, what have we done here? Now, let me say about old Edward Snowden here, as much as I'd like to see him hung from the highest yard arm there, but on the other hand, he's living in a Moscow winter, so, okay. Um, here's what I would say, and that is, do not forget that, you know, when you look at an Edward Snowden, this is someone who represents probably about 25 to 30 percent of the American population. Remember, our Constitution, when you read that thing, and I would advise actually someone going ahead and just reading it. It's not very long, by the way. It's one of the shorter constitutions of the world, in fact. Um, that nice man, Alexander Hamilton, whose songs we all sing now, uh, he didn't trust people to this as you throng. And neither did any of our founding fathers. And they wanted to make sure that things were balanced off. Um, they wanted oversight. They wanted express oversight. Uh, they wanted the executive to be balanced off by a judiciary and a legislative branch. And they wanted the legislative branch to be balanced off by the other two. The collection of this kind of information hit right down the gut of that that whole issue. It hits it, it is like a Snowden was like a like a diamond merchant. Just hit it right on target. The facet exploded. And it's an issue that we have not still really addressed. I think when things get bad or things happen, people are willing to sort of let it go and, okay, fine, let's collect. Um, it's incumbent on us, I think, to make sure that the Senate and the House Intelligence Oversight Committees do oversight. Uh, there's a lot of politicking going on, as you might be shocked on Capitol Hill. There's a lot of politicking going on sometimes, but one of their jobs is to conduct that oversight. I want to see those privacy boards filled with people. Uh, overseeing this process and it's not necessarily happened um you know am i concerned about it well you know i drive down the highway and there are cops on the road all the time and they're looking to see if i'm speeding so from a personal standpoint no i'm not worried about it from a societal standpoint you know we seem to be like the frog getting boiled here slowly but surely we're getting used to more and more of this kind of collection is it justified the answer seems to be yes but only if you're providing the kind of oversight on it, and I would I be comfortable with it? And I don't think we have that oversight yet. I think there'll be people who say they're that oversight. But the fact of the matter is, um, I really, honest to God, believe that we haven't had the kind of debate that we still need to have on the subject. Uh, and the reason I want that debate, frankly, is because what I'm more worried about is what happens when you don't have the debate, uh, when something inevitably screws up. Um, there's a government system, a grade, a pay scale system called the GS system. And uh, it goes from one through 15. And my belief in life is you're always exactly one GS four away from a screw up. Uh, it's always the little guy. It's the bartender and the, in the, in the, uh, in the shootist that killed John Wayne, that kind of thing. Uh, I'd rather have us debating this in advance uh, than I would see another Snowden, for instance, where everything sort of flies up in the air. Everybody's running around. And by the way, we didn't end up any different when it was all said and done. That merrying around spun right around and we're right back where we started. Mm -hmm. Share with us uh, a case study about how valuable intelligence was in a particular situation, how it really played a big role. This doesn't need to be contemporary, it can be historical, but just one example. And you teach intelligence now, so I'm sure something has come to mind. Well, I thought, um, you know, well, first of all, you know, what's the book about teachers teaching for, for other reasons? Um, so the question on that one, I'll tell you what, let's, let's do one that we can all, we can all relate to. 
um, I, I have a certain fondness for for movies, and and so as consequence, I, I find them useful in terms of um, in terms of pointing out the example. Um, I, I I'm I love Rambo, and I'm sorry. I apologize. To you right up front for it. Uh, and I always remember in Rambo three, do we get to win this time? Um, which I thought actually was an interesting comment on the post Vietnam War era. Do we get to win this time? Um, that's a great political statement. In fact, uh, ignoring the fact that you had to, you know, basically watch Rambo ran, you know, run a tank into a high helicopter. That didn't make any sense. But nonetheless, and surviving it. The Afghan war in the 80s was a classic example of good intelligence war done well on multiple levels. Um, it was clear that the Carter administration, to some extent, got caught off guard with it. Uh, people were showing, the intelligence community certainly had been showing information indicating that the Russians were piling up on the border here. Uh, this is, again, a case. And, you know, this is not about a stupid man. This is about, you know, President Carter looked at it and, and just decided, look, I've talked to the Russians. What you're saying is interesting, but it doesn't make sense vis-a-vis -vis what other information I've gathered here. Russians went into Afghanistan. President Carter was upset. Uh, President Carter put forward what's called a covert action plan. Um, the National Security Council, those chief State Department and the Defense Department, all that come together. And they put together a plan with the intelligence community in mind, CIA in particular, uh, as to how they might support different groups in different areas. In this case, we were going to support the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. It was a deliberate plan that was drawn up to give them weaponry and to give them something to fight back with the Russians. Because the analysis was indicating at that point that the Russian army would not stand up to a long fight. That the Russian army that we knew from World War II, you know, Shukov, with four and a half million men running through Eastern Europe, wasn't going to happen. In fact, if anything, quite the contrary, they were having problems maintaining their discipline. They were having problems with people actually leaving in droves. Uh, they were having problems with black tar heroin use. Um, because of the, the Taliban and others, the Muj that were selling the heroin in Afghanistan to the soldiers there. So the intelligence community really provided an interesting niche where we could begin to chip away at what had been the most recent expansion of Soviet power. What the intelligence community was able to do during that period was to help manage that fight. You could not have a more direct conflict between the U.S. and the Russians than you did in Afghanistan. Just couldn't. Short of our time in Vietnam, where we had Russian pilots and Chinese pilots flying, but on a relatively small level. This was about the U.S. providing arms, training to a group of people in who were trying to get their countries back, and the Russians were standing on their way. Our ability to get them information, to get them support and training during that period, um, even the little things, or well, not little things, but things that seem sort of funny in, in retrospect. There's another movie with Tom Hanks, uh, Charlie Wilson's War. Uh, that was about a strategic tactical move, again, that has been analyzed um, or, or brought forward by CIA, which is the Russians were killing us from the air. We had no control over the air in Afghanistan. They were using Hind helicopters to come in. They were using bombers to come in to drop weapons, uh, anti-personnel weapons, uh, toys with anti-personnel weapons that had to kill the children. Uh, it was pretty vicious stuff. They controlled the cities. They didn't control the areas outside. But nevertheless, they were beating the heck out of our guys. The Charlie Wilson's war was about, 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 about someone from the Congress he was approached by someone who actually knew within the agency um, with an idea that if we were able to rework that weaponry, that in fact it would give us a tactical advantage and begin to turn the tide on the Russians. Very simply, we gave them Stinger missiles. And the debate was about someone on the Hill who would be able to provide the money and allow CIA to go ahead and provide that material to the Mujahideen, which they did. And that was a key point in that war. So the ability of CIA to sort of constantly see where the Russians were, what they were doing tactically or strategically, um, and where they were in their politics at the time. Um, Afghanistan truly, along with Star Wars, broke the back of the Soviet Union. 
Afghans now. The Russians came out of that war while the losses seem relatively small versus what we had suffered in other wars. I think they lost maybe 18, 20,000 people. It was so devastating to that society at the time. Uh, the loss of faith in a military complex in which the Russian economy was roughly a one third devoted to military. So after all that money and all that time, what happens? We essentially get beat in a small brush war. Um, that was that was CIA all the way, and probably one of its finest ones. Okay, you've referenced, uh, I think, a couple times tonight, and you and you and I talked about this before the program. You've referenced popular culture, culture, and how much you like movies. Um, is there a spy movie that is realistic? Yeah, I, I was, uh, well, of course, my wife looks like Ursula Andrews, so I have nothing else to say. Um, <laughs> we are sending the tape of this back, aren't we? I yeah. hope I hope I can get this, I'm going you know, to get her to play this. Um, believe it or not, there are there are a few movies there. Now, obviously, these are people are looking for entertainment, and any time you deal with this, you're, you're dealing with it. And I've now had the occasion now to advise on a couple of movies, and I'm supposed to go out to L.A. I actually need that and sit down with some people who are looking to do some things for Netflix. Um, from a, a standpoint of, well, let's just go oral James Bond there. There's a movie called From Russia With Love. That probably is the best operational movie I've ever seen of that era, uh, where someone is meeting someone on a train. Uh, they're coming in to see the local station about what's going on. Uh, the Bulgarians are doing things for the Russians, that kind of thing that captures that era reasonably well. Um, you know, there's some of the other bond stuff and all that. The Russians being willing to use people to, you know, kill people. Yeah, uh, that's always been true. That one is actually not too bad. That one's, you know, for the, and, you know, it has to be entertaining. It's got to be light, right? I mean, this, this is, you know, this is what entertainment is all about. Um, the British love counterintelligence, love counterintelligence. And John le Carre is the king of that. And if you can get over John le Carre's anti American biases, of which he has many, um, not like many other upper class Brits. Um, I think Tinker Taylor, Soldier Spy, is worth several watchings. Uh, you'll pick up on a slightly different system from us. Uh, our officers in the field drill directly with the assets. The British don't have that. They have a system where they have somebody else from spotting first, and then and then they bring in someone else. Uh, the Ricky Tarr character in that case was the spotter in the field. Um, that's actually pretty good in terms of how someone works their way through and tries to ferret out spies. Um, counterintelligence is a fascinating field. My wife spent a lot of her career in it, and it really is smoke and mirrors at its best. You're trying to figure out who's doing something to you, and they clearly don't want to be found. So there's a lot of a lot of aspects to that movie. I think that are pretty good. Um, the television show The Americans, uh, actually, from the Russian standpoint, is pretty good. Uh, the best part I ever saw, because they do use sleepers. I mean, they do, as you probably saw in northern New Jersey, they, they sometimes, the Russians just love this stuff. Um, when you have 500 years worth of dictatorship and information is power, trust me, you get good at it, okay? It's in their blood. But the Americans, I thought, was pretty good. And the, there was one episode where Reagan was, where, where Reagan had been shot. The Russians did not get what happened after that. They were sure it was a coup d'etat. They were sure that the moment that Al Haig showed up on the air, uh, that it represented the military taking over the government of the United States. And as I recall, the wife in that show said, no, 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 you don't understand. That's not the way this is going to work. And they wouldn't believe her. That happened on a couple occasions in the 80s, too, where they just didn't believe that we were doing something. And they, they almost went to nuclear war once over it. Those are actually the, some of the better ones I've seen. Um, Homeland is not bad, but Claire Danes gives me a sinus headache. Um, she looks like she needs her contacts in all the time. And I know a lot of women at the agency who just hate that show. Um, as in many parts of, of business and government, uh, women in the last 20 years have taken their place. Uh, Gina Haspel is the head of CIA right now. Gina was two classes behind me. Um, you know, have taken their place uh, in the leadership of this community, and uh, they don't like Claire Danes' character. Uh, they feel she's a flake, and it takes away from their work. Uh, on the other hand, you know, she's been out to the agency, as have others, so, you know, there's sort of a little pit stop tour they all do. Um, 
it, it's a little more expressive of modern times in terms of dealing with the terrorist aspect of it. Um, but I think those those would be the ones I would pick. There, we were just talking about the ones that I didn't like. Um, any of the ones where you see someone left behind, uh, I must tell you, the code is the same uh, for CIA as it is of the military. We do not leave people behind. We do not leave assets behind. We will go out of our way in some amazing and inventive ways to find those people. There's a movie called Spy Games, as I recall, where they all left old Brad Pitt behind or something like that. And my wife got up and walked out of the theater. She wouldn't tolerate it. Um, I, neither would I, because I can tell you of the, of the, of the blood, sweat, tears, and, and treasure that was spent uh, trying to get people out of places 20 or 30 years after the fact. 20 or 30 years after the fact. It's amazing. Uh, so when you see that kind of thing rejected, if you see guys, uh, you know, driving cars on two wheels like that, you know, sure, maybe. Um, but uh, for the most part, I Hollywood has had a mixed record with it uh, for the most part. But, you know, again, it's entertainment. You have to sort of accept it for what it is. It's like politics, same way, you know. Okay. I have one final question. Then we're going to open it up to your questions and answers. So we have a couple students here with microphones. If you have a question, you know how we do it. Raise your hand, wait for one of them to come by, and then uh, that way we can everybody can hear you, A, and we can get it on our streaming video as well. But my final question for you, Ron, is we have a lot of young people here tonight. Why should they consider a career in intelligence, and what should they be doing to prepare for it? Thank you for that. I, my goal here for the last 10 years or so, I'm 63 coming up, has been the idea that now's the time to start sharing here. Uh, and, I, and I really mean that. I, you know, you, you arrive at a certain state in your life. I, there, I've got all the, all the things I need to have, and you know, all I do is buy more. So I want to spend my time trying to do something that's worthwhile, and that's to try to pass on uh, to this next generation. Uh, some of that experience so that they can do what I did, which is ignore half of it and uh, and poo-poo the rest of it. And then somewhere along the line, something happens and something clicks in the back of their head. And they go, oh, well, I remember when he said that. Um, I, I don't know how to say it better than duty, honor, country. Um, it sounds cliche. Uh, I, I, never, I never did not think about that every moment I was there. And I think most of the people would say that. Uh, in a private moment after about two or three martinis. Uh, it's not a place that has ever been expressive about that. Uh, I was trying to explain to a friend of mine one time who was um, uh, asking me, well, you know, what was it like when you got done with something and, it, you know, this tremendous thing happened? And I, I will tell you, the, the quintessential CIA reaction is going to look at it and go, you got it done. You got it done. And you move on to the next thing. So that spirit of of drive and can do, and duty, uh, and the honor of serving your country, I, I think that that's just the core of it. And boy, if you're not happy with that, I can't help you. Um, as far as as far as young people are concerned, um, you know, it's been a funny industry over the years. Um, obviously, those people who have language skills. Uh, are of tremendous value. Uh, this is not a country that does well with languages. It just doesn't. We don't have to for the most part. We've got 3.8 million square miles of land. Uh, we've got English for the most part, Spanish coming up. Uh, throw a little French in the corner up in Quebec and you throw in Canada and whatever else. We really don't have a need for languages here. On the other hand, there are another 204 nations out there, many of whom don't speak English. And honestly, to, to understand another culture, truly understand that other culture. You need the language. Why? That's how you get inside of somebody's head. How do they think? Why do they think that way? Even the structure of a sentence um, helps you understand. Um, a lot of people will come to me and ask, you know, do you, you know, it's, should you do poli sci? Should you do international fair? Whatever else. And I, all I can say to that is to try to be as broad based as you can in terms of your knowledge and understanding of the world. Uh, I sit before you as someone with two degrees in economics and one in finance. Uh, I got hired because they needed economists. I wouldn't have shaked that for the world. I would for a job. 
So the idea of understanding the world, and, and this one's gonna, this one's just hard to learn. This is something that, um, and, and every generation, by the way, gets this guy. So trust me, you know, my generation, the, our parents were grumbling about us too on certain issues. Um, there is a tendency with this generation to be very corporate. Uh, there's a set of boxes that they need to check off the way through to get to college, to get to wherever else. And um, a lot of times the question will be, should I take a chance? Uh, should I say yes to something? And you know, my response to the first all is, you know, it's look, if you're not on board the train, you know, you're not on board the train. You can argue about whatever car you're on, but if you're on board the train, then you can argue. But the idea was to say yes to try something, even if it seemed like a long shot to give it a try. Don't psych yourself out of it. Don't say you can't do it. Uh, there are a lot less competent people than you who have tried and are there. Uh, just, just get that out of your head. Just try. If someone offers you an opportunity, take it. If someone says to you, hey, how'd you like to come back to Washington for a few weeks? The answer is yes. I mean, they. I was supposed to enter on duty in January of '84. Someone called me up in September after I passed my poly and said, "Can you come back here?" And my immediate response was, "How soon?" And she said, "Next week." And I said, "Yep, you bet." Now that wasn't genius on my part. That was me obviously craving a salary at that point. But by my very instincts of saying yes, I I had this this wonderful life. And I wouldn't have had it otherwise. So I, I can only encourage young people to try to keep your base spread, be interested in international politics, in politics, study a language, um, try to travel, get out into the world. But when people offer you an opportunity uh, to do something, whether it's a you know a, a week in the capital or a week in Paris or whatever else, take advantage of it, please. Don't don't sit there and worry about how it's going to look on your on your resume going. Let me tell them, let me give you a very sad piece of news. The only thing you're going to look at in your resume is did you get a bachelor's from Kansas and did you get a master's from somewhere else? And there you go. There's your six years right there. Okay. But the experience that you've got in your head and your soul from what you've done, that's going to carry a lot. Of work. That's what I would say. Very good advice. We'll open it up to questions from the audience. Like I said, if you have a question, we'll start over here on this side. We got two questions over here. Um, do make it brief. I'd like to allow as, as much time for as many questions as possible. Do you personally believe that foreign actors use social media to influence the outcome of the most recent elections? Yeah, I would argue over the verb, but I would say they tried to. I, I think the only thing I would say to you on that on the subject, the evidence is out there, so it's just you know serves a bell that they tried. Um, question is the question is how well advertising works, and uh, you know when you have thousands of messages that are put out uh, amongst millions of messages, uh, while they may be targeted to given groups. Having spent a lot of money on advertising and marketing in my life, I can look at you and say, gee, I, we, if there was an inverse square law here, I'd love it. Um, do we want them doing that? No. Uh, is it important that people understand that it's being done? Yeah, because to some extent, by virtue of recognizing it, you have just done a good job of diffusing a lot of it. Um, the Russians love this stuff. Chinese could care less about our politics, but it's hard to do it, not watch. The Chinese care about our technology. The Russians, remember, are a revanchist power trying to come back. They're at number 20 right now, okay? Uh, Putin is the equivalent of Justinian. He's trying to remake an empire that he's not going to remake. Uh, uh, but cyber is a cheap way of engaging. You know, it doesn't cost a lot of money to get 20 kids out there and put up some bots and fire some stuff out. And look at the look at the havoc that he's wreaked just by doing that. I, I don't care whether you supported uh, Mrs. Clinton or whether or not you supported Mr. Trump. It doesn't matter. He wanted one thing to do in that system. That was to, to muck up that system. And he did. Beautiful job of it. But we've also now recognized that. And it also, by the way, goes to back to cyber world again, to understanding uh, that uh, the guys in Silicon Valley, uh, and this is just a pet peeve, so forgive me, uh, who've been taking those micro doses of LSD out there, better knock it off and recognize 
that in fact, what they have created is a worldwide public utility that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the rest of these things communicate worldwide and provide platforms to people, right, left, middle, center, and to sit there and pretend that they are neutral, they, Facebook or Twitter or others are neutral in this process uh, is laughable. But I must tell you one of the challenges, and I'll, I'll say this back to the young people again, of this information age has been the separation of understanding between those people who conduct cyber world and the politics of this world. Uh, s and guys, the science and technology guys and the political guys just don't talk to each other and they don't get it. Uh, if you saw Mark Zuckerberg when he came back to Washington, uh, I was embarrassed by the questions that the United States Senate asked this guy. And by the way, you know and I know, with the exception of Senator Dole, that staffers sometimes write these questions for them. And um, as a consequence of that, that was the staffers that screwed up. So those are the staffers, 30, 32 years old, that are writing this stuff. So there, there's the answer, yes, they have. We have in the past as well on a, on a smaller level. I mean, that's been part of the game forever. The, the speed, the volume, the velocity, your inability to determine the veracity of this information the variety of ways in which it comes in, that's the different part of the game now. And fortunately, I think we've recognized that, but absolutely, you bet they did, of course they did. Okay, we have a couple of questions up here. Then we'll go back here, okay. Uh, you've, you've touched on most of mine, but uh, admiration with Bob Gates. And when he wrote his books, it was a lot of the DOD things. He didn't reveal much. It, they were interesting. But going back to Richard Helms, he was known as the quiet spy. When you worked for him, you kept your mouth shut. And he was adamant about that. So I was appalled also when John Brennan got said what he said. And I, I don't know about you. We signed papers saying you don't do X, Y, or Z for yep. so long. And I'm thinking, how really, how can he do this? I free speech or not, I don't get it. And I think Richard Helms would just croak. It's It's been an interesting evolution uh, of the encounters between the intelligence community and the press over the years. Uh, Helms was at a time, in fact, when that began to loosen a bit because of some of the things that were happening inside. Uh, I know people who still don't speak of William Colby, his replacement, without spitting on the ground. It was very much open and went up to the hill and exposed so the family jewels, it was called, et cetera. In fact, I was actually at a at a uh, uh, a ceremony one time that Bob Gates was having, and everybody was standing around talking to each other, and there lonely over in the corner was was Bill Colby. And I was about to go over and, you know, I said to my senior guys, let's go over to say hi to him. And he grabbed me by the arm and he said, Don't you do it, you'll ruin your career. Now, all that being said. Thanks to CNN, thanks to thanks to the to an age in which information is more fungible, you've certainly have people now who are giving comment uh, in ways that go beyond their agreement. Now they can make comment, by the way, based on their agreement as long as they sort of get it cleared through. So I think sometimes people forget that, and occasionally someone has to remind them of that. I must tell you, I've I've I did a lot of it for a while, uh, back in the early 2000, three, four, five, until some of it began to look like professional wrestling. And I decided I did not want to be part of that. Um, it's, um, it's a fine line to walk. You'll often see people on the air, uh, who have definite viewpoints were not inside of some of the places they said they were. Uh, there's nothing worse than knowing this game and looking across the TV set and thinking to yourself, I know where you were, buddy, and you were nowhere near any of this stuff. Um, so I don't know how you put that genie back in the bottle short of having someone simply say, which has been said, look, if you do this, you'll lose your security clearance. And uh, the people in the, uh, in the National Security Council, uh, one of whom, by the way, is a former Dole staffer, Mira Ricardell, uh, knows very well the relationship between the contracting community and the uh, intelligence community and knows very well that a, the absence of a clearance means that you can't talk 
to anybody. So when that came up, I think that did send a message. How long that message lasts, you know, it's always been a town filled with leaks. It's always been a town filled with trying to make their viewpoint known over somebody else. Is it, you know, a game of, of scoring points? You know, oh, I got my thing in the paper today, that kind of stuff. So I don't think that goes away, but I do think you will see some temperance going forward. How long that temperance lasts, I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry, we need to go on to our next question over here. Uh, sir, you've given your assessment of several movies uh, yeah. from the CIA perspective. I'm just curious as to your assessment of Zero Dark Thirty. Um, I, you know, I, I knew some of the people involved with that. Um, there was one person in particular uh, who had a relaxed grind uh, and felt that her career had been sort of ruined by by some of that. Um yeah, I didn't think it was too bad. Again, I, I have a tough time separating the drama and the and the fact part of it. But, you know, it was a good, it was fairly straightforward in terms of presenting. You know, this is the kind of information that we have. Uh, this is how we try to execute on it, et cetera. Um, is it one of my favorite ones? No, because I know the story. So it's hard to sort of sit there and go, you know, no, I, I, I'm a viewer of all time when it comes to spy movies. I'm so sorry. And I know everybody wants me to tell them, you know, what the good one is, but I'm sitting there going, nope, yep, nope, yep, nope, yep. And I can't help myself. I just, I just can't. But actually, not, not bad for showing what is done to gather information. Uh, you know, the story of Alex Station and uh, Mike Scheuer and those guys who were involved with that was a good one to be told. I mean, there's a, there's a fascinating story to be told about gathering that information, tipping to the fact that he was there. Uh, being able to get the military involved. This is what I would say now versus a previous generation um, is that the the connection now between the military and the intelligence community is a very, very tight one, uh, especially when you're talking about counterterrorism issues. In that film, I thought did a very good job of showing uh, it, it almost seamless operation in terms of people talking to each other and getting things up and knowing what the targeting was going to be and how they were going to do it. It will take part in the execution of it. Um, so that part actually was pretty good. So see, I can't say something positive about a spy movie. <laughs> okay, right here. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to have your opinion on, on this story, which I heard, but I don't think it's true. Uh, back in the uh, days of the first Cold War, there's a very attractive young woman who applied to the CIA. And according to the source that I heard from, she went to an interview with two agents at a, a hotel in uh, Topeka, and they told her that she would be posted to an embassy in East, some East European country, and her job would be to establish relationships with uh, Soviet personnel and try to get them in, in, in and so they would be prone to uh, cooperate with with the U.S. Um, they they were never there when I needed them. Um, when I was single, when I was single. Um, first first of all, on a, on a very very serious note, I mean, you bring up a very serious question. The answer is it has been agency policy from day one not to do that. There are many reasons not to do that. The least of which is if on a very practical level. People who are involved in that kind of thing, and by the way, the Russians do love their honey traps, they're called. Uh, the fact of the matter is people get angry. They feel trapped. Um, when you establish a relationship with someone, so the answer is no. Uh, hell of a story, though. Um, you were sure they were CIA guys, huh? Seriously. Um, it's, uh, they, they flip the credentials and everything. Do they? Okay, fine. Um, you know, uh, you want to establish a relationship with that person whom you recruit and who is working with you. Notice I chose the term working with you. Um, they are putting their lives in your hands. Um, I, I'm going to try to work my way around a little story here to give you an example of that because it's still, I, I want to say it correctly in a way that it makes sense and still, you know, keeps a few things here hidden. Um, I was in a meeting one time with someone who did not know me by my name. 
And we were talking about a very serious issue. He wished to go back to a place we did not want him to go back to because he would probably have been killed. Um, we were very serious about wanting to sort of keep him where he was and talk about how we might get him out, et cetera. So, and there's no good answer on my my good response for me on this one, except for just what had happened. All right, so in the middle of this meeting, out of nowhere, I mean, we're meeting in sort of a public plaza and there's some people around keeping an eye on me, et cetera, in the middle of this thing, in the middle of this thing, from just about that far back in the room, someone yells out, Ron, Ron Marks, what are you doing here? <laughs> and this guy comes steaming toward me. Now, I hadn't seen this guy since Portland, Oregon, like 10 years before, right? Honest to God. And I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking to myself, well, the first thing you think of always when you're a young officer is, well, how the heck am I going to write this thing up? Um, and, and what kind of clever what clever ways am I going to be able to do it? So he comes over to the table and he shakes my hand and I, you know, hey, great, I don't have a card with me right now. But if, you know, we can get together and we talk. So we talk for about a minute and he blows away. And I'm thinking to myself, this is, you know, this is, we've just blown this thing wide open. Uh, the guy sitting in that chair opposite me didn't blink and went on with his conversation as though nothing had happened. And I thought to myself as I was walking back to where I needed to go to, report on this my first thought was boy this thing really screwed up and the second thought that I started to have and not really probably not until later on was this guy didn't say anything why didn't he say anything and I had a very wise chief at that point who looked at me and he said don't you understand his life is in your hands so you bet he's not and that agreement that you have, that relationship that you have, there, that person's life is in your hands. So you don't violate that. And you don't put them in a position where they're feeling pressured. Uh, because if you do, it'll blow wide open. And that is not where you want to be. Not good business, to put it politely. Okay. Uh, we have uh, someone. Oh, you got one back there. And then I see there's a person across from here and a couple more questions up here. We get to as many of these as we can in the next 10 or 12 minutes. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you could give us the CIA perspective on our president meeting privately with Putin and in the Oval Office. And does that put our government at risk or what would be the CIA perspective on that? Now, here's my response where I come back with, no, um, I can't because, first of all, I don't represent CIA. I represent myself. I mean, that relationship is, you know, long gone, far away. Um, on, a, on a personal Ronald Marks note, I would say to you, um, yeah, you know, given everything that's been on, you know, going on at this point, I don't know. Um, I'm having a tough time sorting out the politics and the reality here. Uh, is, does the president of the United States have a right to meet with the guy who's the leader of Russia? Yeah, of course he does. That's part of the part of the game. Um, are they saying things to one another? Couldn't even begin to tell you. Uh, would there be a concern about that? Maybe. You've certainly heard people leak about it. Uh, nobody stood up on their hind legs and said anything. They just leaked it in the paper. That's all. So I, you know, I really don't know what to say. I know there's the great vast conspiracy on this one, and, and it's going to be right or left, depending upon where you go and whether or not you view. I mean, this is a this is an impre unprecedented president and unprecedented election. This was and a lot of hard feelings left over from that. Um, I'm going to trust that anybody who occupies that office uh, is going to understand uh, that there's certain information. Uh, that can't be presented. On the other hand, I got to break the bad news to you on this one. The president of the United States, uh, from Lyndon Johnson to Jack Kennedy to Richard Nixon to President Roosevelt to President Truman to Eisenhower, you run it all the way up the line, President Ford, has the right to decide what's classified and what's not. So if they want to walk in there at some point and say, guess what, we're not happy with this, they can and I think that gets a little lost sometimes uh, in personalities and and other things that uh, that go on in the in the press. I know that's a non-answer, but I'm from Washington D.C. and that's the best you'll get. <laughs> okay, do we have a question back here? 
So I know you mentioned briefly earlier that the privacy oversight in the government could use some improvement. Um, so I'd like to know your opinion on the phrase, uh, if you don't have anything to hide, then you shouldn't be afraid. Do you agree or disagree? Um, that actually sounds like Mrs. Marx, um, who is who is a much more hard over on this than, than her than her husband. Um, there's a part of me that says that yes, I, I agree. I mean, if you're if you're not doing anything, what are you worried about? On the flip side of it, you know, we we have a constitution here that gives us certain rights of keeping the government out of our business. I don't have any problem with them doing it as long as everybody's agreeing that that's what it is that we need to do here or explaining themselves. Like I said, I think the big shock of Snowden, which I noticed by the way, after San Bernardino and Boston tended to tamp down a little bit and Orlando um, was the one of shock. We didn't know what was happening, that there was this much that was being collected. And NSA frankly did not do a great job of explaining itself. This is not because they are stupid or bad people. It is simply because the culture of the place was one of silent collection and had been doing it for 60 years um, it was now in a different role. CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, I don't know, Ambrose Lambertson, the State Department are used to being frontline organizations and sort of having to explain themselves to a policymaker. You know, why are we doing this, kids? And then having it questioned or debated. NSA was not used to that, especially on something that is so new to people. It feeds into the American narrative of not trusting government. And when you do that kind of thing, you, you just put your hand on that third hot rail like that, and they got the shock for it. Um, there are a lot of them that are very angry about it, uh, but I think, uh, I think you've seen in, in, uh, in, in General in, uh, Admiral Rogers and in, uh, General Naxoni, uh, people who understand that, that they got to get out there and they got to explain themselves. Mike Hayden, I think, has done a wonderful job of trying to explain. These are some of the leaders of NSA and of, of CIA. As to what it is that they're trying to do, you can't expose everything. And that, of course, is the damn you do, Dan, if you don't think. But at least getting out there and explaining, look, this is sort of why we need to do this. And, you know, we appreciate that we're in a in a different state now. The other challenge is you're included in that question is, you know, when does this thing ever end now? And the answer is it doesn't, at least for this generation. I, I can only say to you that I lived in a Cold War that lasted from 45 to 91 uh it's made a brief comeback here uh but you know we're now in we're now 16 7 17 years and it was essentially going to be a generational war and it's not even our war in the sense of you know we're the big western representative but the fact of the matter is as one of my distinguished colleagues uh said to me one time over at um, I, I do a lot with oxford he said you must understand ron that this is a food fight within islam that in fact this is about a disagreement fundamentally when where a religion is going to go and you have people who put it politely are revanchists and want to pursue a different time and that's not going away for a while that's a fundamental difference so we're going to have to deal with that reality and dealing with that reality means we're going to have to think about how we do our intelligence how we do our law enforcement work and as we enter deeper into cyber world what's the difference between a law enforcement action and a national security action if North Korea attacks a Japanese-owned American subsidiary in the movie business and whose main information that was leaked out to everybody is that Jennifer Lawrence isn't a nice person or she wants too much money or whatever else, is that a national security issue? The Obama administration chose to say yes. Why? Because it was North Korea attacking an American institution. We don't have a lot of examples of that. The data points aren't there yet. So there's a lot of this stuff that's up to you guys. Us, you know, old geezers will be, you know, hey, listen, I'm already getting my federal pension. Just wait till my Social Security kicks in. Um, you know, I, my decision-making days are, are dwindling. You're the guys that have to make up your minds on this. And it's important to be involved in this process. We have a question right here. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, you talked a little bit about the dangers of politicized intelligence, and I was wondering, um, from your experience, what structures are there from an institutional standpoint within CIA and then the intelligence community more broadly 
uh, to ensure that the intelligence presented to policymakers is as objective as possible. My my first thought when you when you said that was a friend of mine called politicization nailing fog to a wall. That you sort of know it when you see it, but you're not altogether sure. Um, there is a heavy review process here. Uh, I mean, of multiple layers. I mean, none of that stuff gets out of there because some kid wakes up in the morning and decides, hey, I'm going to do an article on blanks. Trust me, there are like five, six, seven, eight, nine layers that this stuff goes through. That being said, you can get group think. People start going along the same line. And then um, it's awfully hard to beat. You have to constantly recognize that. You're taught to recognize that. Uh, the other factor that comes into play um, Smiling a little bit, as, as one of my said, one of my friends once said, it's, about, it's also about cranky people. It's about people who don't like having their intelligence fools yet, and so they'll object to someone doing it. I mean, I've I've been in meetings where the where the the director of intelligence, the very lead analyst, has been insulted by a GS ten or twelve uh, officers that know you're wrong. The ethos of that system, by the way, is in fact to accept that 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 person uh, who is sitting there is the expert. Uh, that young person like yourself. I, that's the other, the other thing I would, again, taking off in your early question, the young people here, please do understand. You know, I realize that when you're 24, 25 years old, life is just like this long road out there. And if I start talking to you about being 30 or so, you're looking at me like I'm talking about the Treaty of Westphalia, you know, 600 years ago. Uh, here's the thing. You by age 26, 27, 28, 29, uh, I was writing presidential daily briefs. Okay. Um, it's an organization throughout the intelligence community that pushes down very quickly, it expects responsibility at a high level early. So you as the analyst, you as the person collecting that information, it's ultimately up to you to make sure that that information doesn't get politicized. Now, you know, God forbid, you might have a political viewpoint too. Um, and it can it can be very raucous. Uh, Bob Gates is second nomination to director of central intelligence. I spent four solid months of my life working that issue as one of the Senate liaisons, was held up primarily over the issue of the politicization of intelligence. The feeling was that, uh, that Bob Gates was too tied to the Reagan administration uh, and they wanted a negative picture presented of the Soviet Union uh, in the sense of the militarization and uh, an adventurism of it. Uh, there are a number of analysts who testified against him on Capitol Hill, one of whom was one of my CT classmates, in fact. They were mixing DI and DO in those days. Um, and uh, several prominent analysts uh, felt that, uh, that Bob Gates had skewed information on several estimates. Um, they made their case. The Senate Intelligence Committee reviewed it and decided that that was not the case. Uh, but it's one that can be made. It is one that is made constantly. Um, there is an interesting set of review processes going through it. But like any organization, you know, the other, the other thing to keep in mind is you're moving product here, guys. You know, sometimes things just get through and you can't make it work. But if you have a good logical argument, I think there are enough mechanisms in that system uh, to challenge it. Whether or not you can do it successfully depends on circumstance. Okay, we have time for one more question. Do we have one more hand that wants to pop up? Right, right. We have a winner. Hi, <laughs> uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, one thing that crossed my mind was thinking about, you know, the career started for you in 83. Um, what were the tools uh, that were used to gather intelligence back in 1983? Oh, rock sticks. Um, a little mud if you could shape it right. No, I'm, I'm sorry. If someone else had asked me that question recently, because there are obviously an enormous number of, of software tools now available to essentially sort through this information. There's, And I've sold a lot of it over time in my private industry side. There's data mining and data management. Um, management is how you keep this stuff sorted in some logical way. Mining is just what it sounds like. You get software that sort of sorts through it all, picks through it all. You have analyst notebook, which compares relationships with people. Um, it was it was a simpler time in terms of the volume of information. Um, 
it was also a more simple target um, in the sense of you, they look like us. Uh, they were a nation state. Uh, they had a Ministry of Defense. Uh, we had a Defense Department. Uh, they had a Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we had a State Department. Um, the spies looked like us. They were trying to recruit people to gather information, primarily looking at our, our not our technology, but our insight in our political system, our political decision making process, et cetera. So there was that kind of, of sort of almost a symbiosis of playing off each other. You knew each other well. Um, frankly, the the thing that you were that you were focused on, I you know, was a very simple thing. I tell my students this all the time. I said, look, you know, if the missile silos were open in the Ukraine, you were about to have a very bad day. If the missile silos were closed in the Ukraine, well, it might not be the best day in the world, but you know, you're going to get through it. Um, we don't have existential threats here now, for the most part. Uh, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be a rogue, you know, missile strike of some form. Please don't get me wrong. Uh, but I think all of us in this room of a certain age certainly remember sitting in hallways and schools. Um, and remember the the nightmare scenarios of you know the potential of 1500 intercontinental ballistic missiles coming to the US uh within an hour to two essentially killing off a pretty fair portion of the population by the way us being able to do the same thing with that um i i still have a tough time speaking of movies watching uh uh movies uh like dr strange love or on the beach or whatever else i can actually feel my throat tightening up um, the horror show that happened on 9-11 uh, of 3,000 of our citizens being killed on American soil uh, in a way that hadn't happened since Antietam um, is a horror show. Um, and to, to dismiss that would be foolish and wrong. But it makes it a different kind of war. It's a very personal war. It's a very, it's an intimate war. It's done by individuals and small groups. It, it places a lot of emphasis on, on trying to gather information around it because it's hard to get into them. Um, it's not, hi, I'm Ron Marks. I'd like to join Al Qaeda here in, uh, in Russell, Kansas. I'm sure Qaeda in Russell, Kansas. Boy, I'll hear about that. Um, you're not going to, it's not going to happen. Um, so how do you gather that information? How, how do you try to find what kinds of things are going to be? What they're looking to do is to terrorize you, not to destroy you. So while it is not an existential threat, in the sense of everybody's going to die, what it is is a persistent, long-term, low-intensity conflict kind of threat. And that requires different kind of information gathering, a much more sophisticated kind of information gathering but a much more persistent kind of almost a law enforcement approach as we would know it to trying to deal with these guys. And by the way, it's not just a threat, you know, overseas, it's a threat here. And that also differentiates from the difference from our, from my period. Yeah. We worried about spies and yes, the Americans are about Russian sleepers and all the rest of this stuff. But the fact of the matter is they weren't going to commit violence on American soil. Uh, these people oftentimes are self-recruiters. I don't like the term lone wolf, by the way. Nobody's a lone wolf. This stuff. They self-recruit. Um, it's also one of the dangers of cyber war. Um, this is more close contact. It's more intimate. And that is much harder to deal with because it's a mix of things and we still have a 20th century bureaucracy and a bit of a 20th century mindset dealing with the 21st century problem we're getting there i mean the but we've also set a very high goal for ourselves. you know from a political standpoint we spend what 48 billion dollars a year uh for the last 17 years on homeland security the homeland security department itself um we have said whether we mean to or not that we have zero tolerance zero risk for any kind of terrorist activity in the u.s period How'd you like to fail on that one? And that's also what pushes into your issue in terms of the gathering of the information. How much do we need to do to do this? The answer is there's no such thing as 100% security. It just isn't. I can, I can cite chapter and verse pulling people in and out of East Germany. 
600,000 Soviet ground forces, 800,000 people in national security within 18 million people, spotters on every block, and you'd still get people in and out of the country. I'll try with this system. So a long-winded way of saying it's a very, it's very different now. The existential part is not there. The threat is there. How you balance that threat, how the society views that threat, how much the society is willing to allow intelligence on its soil. Um, I think that's just going to continue to swing to the now. And it will depend upon how we're feeling at the time. And I will guarantee you if something goes wrong again, we're going to get real hard over. And when it doesn't go, we're going to drip past. That's the way it is going forward. Okay, Ron, thank you so much for a You're great welcome, friend. Thank you. Delighted. Delighted to join What a fun. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And um, do remember what Barbara mentioned, the Dole Leadership Prize. Our guest and the recipient this year is former Secretary of State James A. Baker. That is a week from tomorrow at 2 p.m. Hope to see you all back here. Thank you. My name is Alan Luxenberg. I'm president of the Farm Policy Research Institute. Uh, my job uh, tonight is uh, simply to uh, recite the batting order and uh, to uh, thank the appropriate people uh, for their roles in this uh, in this event. Uh, this is our Arlene and Stanley Ginsburg Family Foundation Lecture Series, uh, which is held monthly here at the National Liberty Museum, our, our host sponsor. And tonight we have a, a third sponsor, which is the Free Libraries of Philadelphia, uh, as this particular event is part of their book, One Philadelphia Series, which is a collection of events taking in place all around uh, on a book called Cold Mountain, but uh, you will hear more about that in just a minute. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce Kalilia Williams, who represents the Free Library and the One Book, One Philadelphia program. After she speaks, Ron Granieri, who is the executive director of our Center for the Study of America in the West, host of our monthly Geopolitics with Granieri program, and now, and now, a pop leader in chief for panel discussions like these. He will then take on the, uh, the role of moderating tonight's discussion. Uh, before I call upon Kalilia, I should mention that uh, tomorrow night, if you haven't received an invitation from us, uh, we did invite uh, uh, that we could contact in time to an advanced screening of the movie Eye in the Sky starring Helen Mirren at the Ritz Five Theater. Uh, you are welcome to come as our guest. You just need to let us know uh, by email or in person that you will be there at 7.30 at the Ritz Five. It's a movie about drones and drone warfare. We do have a number of our members and scholars and trustees going to the uh, movie, including uh, our own in-house expert on drones, uh, Michael Boyle from LaSalle University. Uh, then uh, I should remind you that on Sunday, April 17th, is, is, is our annual brunch for uh, partners of FPRI, uh, donors at a particular level, and that includes a panel discussion moderated by Marty Moss Cohen of the WHYY Radio Times and featuring Trudy Rubin of the Inquirer and our own uh, Jihadi Hunter online, uh, Clint Watts, our Robert A. Fox fellow, talking about uh, can this be stopped? So uh, without further ado, let me call upon Kalilia, and then she'll turn it over to Ron. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kalila Williams, the director of One Book, One Philadelphia, and along with the chair of One Book, One Philadelphia, our wonderful Marie Field. We are very excited about the book choice for 2016, which is Cold Mountain, 
Um, and uh, we're also really excited about our calendar of events, which uh, if you all haven't picked one up, they're downstairs at the registration table. Um, we've got a lot of great events. Unfortunately, they're only going on until March 30th. However, there's many things to look forward to. So I encourage you to pick up a, um, a calendar. Um, one book, One Phil Philadelphia is a, an initiative by the Free Library of Philadelphia, which promotes literacy, library usage, and encourages the city to come together around a featured book. And the book Cold Mountain is the story of W.P. Inman, um, who is a Civil War soldier. He's a Confederate soldier who's journeying home. Um, he's had enough and he would like to go home. Um, so he's going. Um, and um, and his feelings about the war and uh, probably embody the feelings about that many soldiers had where they did really in many cases they didn't necessarily have a personal stake in the war um and what's very exciting about this program tonight um first of all the free library has had a long-standing partnership with the foreign policy research institute and the national liberty museum so that's very exciting but the other thing is that we often don't hear about the international response to the civil war we usually hear about a national response and a localized response but never um we never hear this side of the story so this is very exciting um and we're thrilled to be here so thank you thank you Kalila. thank you everybody for joining us tonight uh, i am indeed ron granary the director of fpri's center for the study of america in the west and i'm uh uh, very pleased to be moderating this discussion and to be part of so many different uh, 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 interesting programs here at FPRI and this this wonderful confluence of the Stanley and Arlene Ginsburg family lecture series and One Book, One Philadelphia here in this uh, particularly interesting room here at the National Liberty Museum. But it's, it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, our goal, one of the reasons why FPRI wanted to participate in One Book, One Philadelphia is FPRI is very interested in linking up with the larger Philadelphia community. We are very proud to be a Philadelphia organization. And while we are, while we study the world, um, our, our head may be in the clouds, our feet are firmly on the ground at 1528 Walnut Street. And so we are always looking for ways to reach out to that larger community. And so we're delighted to see a lot of familiar faces here, but I'm also delighted to see a lot of faces I haven't seen before at FPRI events. I hope to see many of you in the future. So tonight, uh, we do want to do something a little different, as, as Kalila said, right? We want to take a familiar topic and we want to look at it from a slightly different perspective or a, a less, perhaps a less familiar perspective for a lot of people uh, uh, in the audience. When uh, Americans discuss the Civil War, they usually do so with an intense focus on the specifically American aspects of the conflict, right? The regional differences, the connection to the historical development of the Republic, the long-term inability of American leaders to develop a coherent and sensible response to the problem of slavery and how it played out in American politics. And this, of course, makes a great deal of sense. The Civil War was indeed the culmination of a century of contradictions and unresolved conflicts within the American experiment. And in the Cold War settlement, such as the Civil War settlement, I should say, such as it was, uh, did not solve all of those problems, but it did move American history in another direction uh, where we still then live with the legacy of the conflict and both the successes and failures of dealing with it ever since. Now, as the war was raging, protagonists on both sides claimed the mantle to be the true defenders of the revolution and attempted to justify their side before the history and the world. Uh, and there was even at the time and certainly since and uh, uh, a desire to pro to portray this conflict in, in epic terms, right? This was a titanic struggle. That fratricidal slaughter um, has inspired epic comparisons ever since. Shelby Foote famously called this, his story of the Civil War, My Iliad, right? Or an, an American effort to develop a, a tragic epic story um, of this massive conflict. And Charles Fraser's Cold Mountain, which traces Inman's long journey home from the war, aspires to be an American odyssey. Right, so as we try to think of this in its in its epic terms, but the Civil War, how it's, the Civil War is big enough and epic enough simply within its American framework. But it's more than that, or it needs to be thought of as more than just that. It cannot be disconnected from the larger world of the late 19th century. The roots of the conflict went deep, not only into American politics, but into the developing global economy. Right, an economy that centered not only on cotton and slavery, but also on the growing agricultural and industrial might of the northern states. The implications of the Civil War did not escape the attention 
of the great powers of the time. Britain and France, as we will discuss, each considered the possibility of direct intervention, and while neither quite took that plunge, each sought to get what advantage they could out of the conflict, either through trade or negotiation with uh, with Lincoln's government, or in the case of France in particular, through an ill-fated effort to seize influence in Latin America uh, by supporting the, uh, the sadly ill-fated Habsburg second brother, the Emperor Maximilian. Even beyond uh, conventional diplomacy, the 1860s were a crucial watershed in world history. Understanding the economic, political, and social forces at work helps put the Civil War into a larger global context. The triumph of the Union was just one example of successfully modernizing, centralizing forces in states around the world. Bismarck, for example, who became minister president of Prussia in 1862, admired Lincoln's ability to overcome the, the resistance of local grandees and to create a more centralized state. Just as the architects of the Meiji Restoration in Japan in 1867 sacrificed the samurai in the name of building a modern, centralized Japanese state. Just one example of how we need to think of the Civil War within this larger global conflict, global context. It has become a commonplace to talk about how globalization has broken down national borders and how the internet has encouraged connections across them. To the extent that for Americans in particular, we now understand that whatever happens elsewhere, our current presidential election has offered enough examples of, of how the world is watching and how we debate what our actions say about us and how we relate to the larger world. A careful study of the Civil War era should remind us that this is not a brand new thing. The whole world is watching us now. It was watching us then, too. All of which brings us to our topic for tonight. What was the connection between the crisis of the Union and the larger world? How, if at all, did, did forces try to influence the outcome of the war? And how was the global position of the United States changed by the Civil War? These questions and yours will guide us uh, in our discussion with our guests, Professors Walter McDougall and Gregory Irwin. Now, Professor Walter McDougall is the co-chair of FPRI's Madeline and W.W. Keene Butcher History Institute, the chairman of the FPRI Board of Advisors, also happens to be my boss as the chair of FPRI's Center for the Study of America and the West, and he sits on the board of editors of FPRI's journal Orbis. He is also the Alloy Anson Professor of International Relations and Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. His honors include a Pulitzer Prize, election to the Society of American Historians, and appointment to the Library of Congress Council of Scholars. He is the author of a long list of books, beginning with France's Rhineland Diplomacy, 1914 to 1924, and all the way down to, uh, to more recent texts, such as Promised Land Crusader State, the study of American foreign relations since 1776, uh, a two-volume history of the United States through the Civil War era, Volume 1, Freedom Just Around the Corner, and Volume 2, Throes of Democracy. So he is particularly well-suited to talk about the international relations of the Civil War. Dr. Gregory J.W. Irwin is an FPRI senior fellow and a military historian whose work spans the American War of Independence through World War II. He's published 10 books, including Facing Fearful Odds, The Siege of Wake Island, which uh, received several awards. He has lectured at uh, at the U.S. Naval Academy, the Military Academy, the Army Military History, History Institute, Philadelphia's Union League, and the U.S. Army War College, among other places. He is the immediate past president of the Society for Military History and is a fellow in both the Company of Military Historians and the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. So somebody else who can talk to us about the uh, Civil War, uh, its con the conflict, its impact on the United States and the world. What we're going to do tonight is I'm going to give each of the each of our guests a chance to make an statement, and then we will have a little bit of Q&A, and then we will eventually turn the floor open to your questions. So first, I would like to invite Professor McDougall to start us off. Walter McDougall. Thanks very much, Ron. He's given me less than 15 minutes, so I am not going to make any jokes. And I'm not going to make any sides or go off on any tangents. I'm just going to read my text. The American Civil War was a historical watershed in at least four geopolitical contexts, two of them national and two of them a transnational. 
First, the Civil War marked a crisis in the classical U.S. grand strategy one might term the Washington Doctrine. In his farewell address, which became over time holy writ comparable to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the father of his country bestowed a veritable book of the law that stated explicitly a list of commandments which, if honored by posterity, would establish the great mutually reinforcing traditions that shaped U.S. foreign relations for the nation's first 120 years. The first tradition was the jealous defense of unity and liberty at home, which required Americans, for instance, to resist the temptation to engage in ideological crusades abroad. The most eloquent expression of that first Washingtonian principle was John Quincy Adams' 1821 declaration, <clears throat> America does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She might become the dictatress of the world, but would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. Another tradition was unilateralism, which Jefferson underscored when he bade Americans to make no entangling alliances. That tradition has been routinely denounced in the 20th and 21st centuries as isolationism. But the truth is no nation, save the British perhaps, was ever less isolationist than the United States from the very start. Another tradition was the American system of states or the doctrine of separate spheres uh, for which the Monroe Doctrine became the shorthand. And the final tradition, continental expansion or manifest destiny as Andrew Jackson's romantic propagandists ennobled the nation's pioneer ambitions for a coast-to-coast -coast empire. But the outbreak of the Civil War, by posing the prospect of two or more hostile countries replacing the United States, mortally threatened all four geopolitical traditions in violation all Americans would have taken for granted, in violation of the very will of God in history. This nation had a manifest destiny, had a, a divine mission, providential mission given to it. To, to crack up the country would be to undermine God's whole plan for history. No wonder unionists damned secession as the unforgivable sin against the Holy Ghost in what I call American civil religion. Second, the second context, the geopolitical context, the Civil War proved to be the crucible in which was forged a singular nation, famously the United States as opposed to these United States, uh, a change that began with Abraham Lincoln. The defection of the South delivered Congress into the hands of a Republican Party eager to save the Union and restrict the expansion of slavery, but also eager to fulfill an ambitious economic agenda which the Democrats had opposed. Hence, the Civil War provided an occasion for the federal government, at last, to promote farming, mining, science, technology, education, transportation, and communication through the Morrill Tariff Act, the Morrill Land Grant Act, the Homestead Act, the Pacific Railroad Act, the National Banking Act, the Department of Agriculture. Historians call it the Second American Revolution. However, those historians who leap from the Civil War to the Spanish-American War and then claim with 2020 hindsight that the Union's triumph somehow had prepared the nation for world power, that the one automatically led to the others, those historians are mistaken. One of the most striking features of Gilded Era politics was the vigorous reassertion by Congress of its constitutional powers. And it used those powers to prevent deviations from those four Washingtonian traditions in foreign affairs. Another um, characteristic of, uh, of Gilded Age uh, politics was the frugality of the, of the legislative and executive branches alike. The federal government shrank from a uh, federal budget shrank from $1.3 billion in 1865 to a lean $241 million by 1877 and it would not reach a billion dollars again before World War I. The most momentous program of that era was the new Navy, launched in the 1880s and 90s, that would later enable the United States to wield world power. But the initial purpose of that Navy was defensive, 
to ward off foreign powers tempted to encroach on the Monroe Doctrine sphere of influence. Fareed Zakaria, in fact, under uh, characterized that era in his own dissertation as one of imperial understretch. And that in turn suggests a third common geopolitical interpretation of the Cold War only also suggests that it's mythical, the dog that didn't bark. According to that myth, the United States was always destined to become a crusader state, zealous to export its values and institutions, if necessary, by force. The only thing holding it back in the early national era had been the perverse survival of slavery and a planter elite alternatively described as a feudal atavism or yet somehow a precursor to 20th century totalitarianism. But, so goes the myth, the Civil War, having purged the United States of that original sin, purified it for a career as the global standard bearer of democracy. Today, that exceptionalist narrative has become an article of faith for neoconservative uh, conservatives on the right and liberal internationalists on the left, both. Only it isn't true. Indeed, the tragic failure of Reconstruction proved the federal government was an incompetent nation builder, even on American soil, let alone in foreign climes. Lincoln himself clung to Washingtonian principles, shunned foreign adventurism, uh, and in fact, Lincoln's voluminous writings contain not one single remark about foreign policy, except that the United States ought to cherish peace and reciprocity with all nations. Far from being an advent, 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 advent of democratic proselytism abroad, Lincoln fretted over whether self-government might even survive at home. That was the meaning of his eloquent second annual message to Congress in 1862. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope on earth. Lincoln was telling his people that the world is watching us, not we the world. And if we should fail, then what hope has the world? Lincoln's concern was not the extension of liberty everywhere, but rather the survival of liberty anywhere. His saintly second inaugural made the point unambiguously. With malice toward none, charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, bind up the nation's wounds, et cetera, et cetera, and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations, unquote. Those were not the words of a crusading knight searching for monsters to destroy. They were the words of a penitent mystic bowing before an inscrutable God. And for three decades thereafter, presidents emulated in this restraint. As late as 1885, Grover Cleveland declared in his inaugural, he would scrupulously adhere, quote, to the policy of independence, of peace suitable to our interests, the policy of neutrality, rejecting any share in foreign broils and ambitions, and repelling uh, their intrusion here. The policy of Monroe, of Washington, and Jefferson, peace, commerce, and honest, honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. Unquote. Indeed, William McKinley promised the same in 1897. And if you had told Americans they were about to leap into the world of war, colonies, and entanglements, they would have dismissed you as mad. Fourth, the American Civil War was nonetheless of tremendous geopolitical relevance precisely because its outcome was not exceptional, but completely in sync with transnational historical trends to which Rod has alluded. Of course, the Union victory was largely determined by the fact that the European sea powers, Britain and France, proved unable or unwilling to recognize, much less ally with, the Confederacy, or else to try to broker a truce through armed mediation. Lincoln and his Secretary of State, Seward, deserve great credit for deterring such intervention through bluff, compromise, economic leverage, and propaganda. However much they were helped by Confederate blunders, such as the self-defeating embargo on the export of cotton. But those important tactical maneuvers played out against the backdrop of a seismic shift around the whole Northern Hemisphere in favor of consolidation, federation of larger national and colonial units, as well as liberal reforms, both of which happened to serve the voracious appetite of the industrial revolution for ever expanding markets and resources. The great consolidation 
might be dated from the California gold rush, which capitalized a 23-year binge of prosperity across North America, Europe, and East Asia. Just consider the long list, Ron mentioned a few, of transformations, transformative events in world politics that ensued, uh, ensued amidst that generation of prosperity. The Taiping Rebellion, an existential crisis for China's Qing Dynasty, which lasted from 1850 to 1864 and claimed at least 33 times more lives than the Civil War. Secondly, the 1854 Crimean War, in which France and Britain defended the Middle East against Tsarist Russia's encroachment and tried, at least, to persuade the Ottoman Empire to modernize. Third, the 1857 Sepoy Mutiny against the British East India Company's rule in India, which obliged the Crown to consult and govern that enormous subcontinent. Four, the 1859 Franco-Austrian War, which enabled the sudden unification of Italy. Five, the 1861 liberation of the serfs and belated launch of industrialization by Russia's reforming czar Alexander II. Six, the 1864 to 71 wars of German unification engineered by Otto von Bismarck and at the same time Bismarck's concomitant adoption of free trade and limited parliamentary government for Germany. Seven, the 1867 Ausgleich, or Compromise, whereby the Austrian emperor granted equality to the Hungarians and federalized the Habsburg Empire. Eight, the 1867 reform, Second Reform Bill, whereby parliament enfranchised the working class, plus the 1867 British North America Act that founded the Dominion of Canada. Ninth, the 1868 Meiji Restoration, whereby rebellious daimyo defeated the feudal and truly isolationist Tokugawa shogunate and then made Japan the first non-Western country to undergo crash industrialization. And 10th, the emergence by 1875 of a third French Republic that proved itself a prototype for America's own future by dint of its precocious democracy combined with imperialism. It was no accident that Frederick Bartholdi delivered the Statue of Liberty to New York Harbor in 1886. Throughout that busy quarter century, the world shrank. Jules Verne could write Around the World in 80 Days in 1873, thanks to the recent completions of the Suez Canal, the Trans-India Railroad, and the U.S. Transcontinental Railroad. Nationalism, liberalism, industrialism, imperialism, those burly isms were hammering like a Lycopian like smithies to forge larger territorial units, deeper political bases, broader markets, and more complex bureaucracies, all in a climate of intense competition. How perverse, therefore, how retrograde, that in February 1861, just days after the czar had abolished serfdom, Jefferson Davis declared the United States dissolved so that slavery might endure. When Lincoln and the North said, in effect, this will not stand, they meant to ensure that Americans did not fall out of step with the deepest rhythms of world history. I hasten to add, that fact does not invalidate a single salty tear drawn by the pathos of the Civil War pathos which Charles Fraser renders so vividly in Cold Mountain. But that fact should serve to remind us that, just as Fraser's story is part of our larger national story, so our national story is part of a larger human story that may, at some future time, outlive the United States itself. After all, it was Abraham Lincoln who said, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. Thank you. Thanks very much, Walter. Greg. I tend to get over animated when I speak, so it's probably safer for my colleagues if I stand <laughs> here. 
Um, I'll move away from you. I'm a military historian, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to take what may appear to be a somewhat narrower attack than Walter in, in uh, telling uh, one man's story and how uh, that relates to the international impact, uh, international military impact of the American Civil War. According to recent scholarship, the total number of Union and Confederate soldiers to perish during the American Civil War stands at 750,000, a 20% increase over the long accepted total of 620,000. Either statistic makes the Civil War the armed conflict that has killed more Americans than any other. Indeed, if we accept the 750,000 figure, more Americans fell in the Civil War than in all our other conflicts put together. Many of us are so familiar with these factoids that we simply take them in stride when we hear them repeated. But let us pause and reflect. The 1860 census reported this country's population as 31 million, and the 2010 census placed it at 308 million, a tenfold increase. If the United States were to wage war today on the same scale as the Civil War, we would have to absorb the depths of 7,500,000 of our young men and women in uniform. Imagine that. And I hasten to remind you that the numbers on Civil War soldier dead uh, do not include non-combatants. And we know that Confederate civilians died in the Union bombardments of Vicksburg and other cities. An uncounted number of slaves were murdered for attempting to flee to the Yankees. Many civilians died at the hands of marauding soldiers, deserters, and guerrillas, and both sides customarily disposed of captured irregulars with summary execution. While the Civil War will undoubtedly remain the source of endless entertainment for millions of our fellow Americans, we should remember it as a blood-choked catastrophe, something that should never be repeated. One of the Civil War's more distinguished participants, Brevet Major General Emory Upton, certainly felt that way. Born on a farm near Batavia, New York on August 27, 1839, this bookish, earnest, and painfully moralistic man graduated from, from, from U.S. Military Academy in June 1861, destined to become one of the Union Army's band of renowned boy generals. Assigned to the Army of the Potomac, Upton displayed a flair for leadership in all three combat branches, excelling as the commander of an artillery battery, an infantry regiment, brigade, and division, and finally a cavalry division. Despite Upton's stellar success, the fact that it took the United States and its military four years to crush the Southern Rebellion and at such an abysmal cost in lives and treasure filled him with disgust. The day after Upton witnessed the futile slaughter of thousands of blue-clad soldiers attacking Confederate earthworks at Cold Harbor, Virginia on June 3rd, 1864, he wrote to his sister, I am disgusted with the generalship displayed. Our men have in many cases been foolishly and wantonly sacrificed. They order assault after assault upon the enemy's entrenchments when they know nothing about the strength or position. Thousands of lives might have been spared by the exercise of a little skill, but as it is, the courage of the poor men is expected to obviate all difficulties. I must confess that so long as I see such incompetency, there is no grade in the army to which I do not aspire. The following day, Upton ranted in a similar vein, I am very sorry to say that I have seen but little generalship during the campaign. Some of our corps commanders are not fit to be corporals. Lazy and indolent, they will not even ride along the lines. Yet without hesitancy, they will order us to attack the enemy, no matter what their position or numbers. As much as Upton disdained the incompetence of his, of his military superiors, he reserved his harshest criticism for America's civilian leadership. As he later put it, in time of war, the civilian, as much as the soldier, is responsible for defeat, feet, 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 and disaster. Battles are not lost alone on the field. They may be lost beneath the dome of the Capitol. They may be lost in the cabinet, or they may be lost in the private office of the Secretary of War. Wherever they may be lost, it is the people who suffer. 
and the soldiers who die. A long-standing policy of starving the United States military in peacetime condemned the Republic to go to war with armies composed mainly of poorly trained citizen soldiers led in large part by men plucked fresh from civilian life. There were just not enough seasoned regular officers available to construct the legions of new recruits or to fill the new command slots created by rapid, rapid military expansion. As for those professional soldiers who received most of the senior commands, too many owed their elevation to political connection than martial talent and experience. Consequently, the Republic suffered the consequences of being defended by armies of amateurs led by amateurs. That resulted in conflicts like the Civil War, which lasted too long, got too many people killed, wasted too much money, destroyed too much property, and forced the federal government to expand its powers and abridge civil liberties. Upton entered his peacetime military career intent on reform and he soon assumed the mantle of the U.S. Army's leading military intellectual. As a bright young man intent on making big changes, he required a patron, and he found a powerful one in William Tecumseh Sherman, who became the Army's commanding general in 1869 after Ulysses S. Grant won the White House. Upton made the most of his opportunities. He ended up composing new tactical manuals for the U.S. infantry, cavalry, and artillery designed to allow American troops to operate more safely and effectively on a battlefield dominated by improved firearms technology, and to also imbue the Army with a better sense of the use of combined arms, infantry, artillery, cavalry working together. As West Point's Commandant of Cadets from 1870 to 1875 upped and improved discipline and training. Then in June 1875, Sherman prevailed on the War Department to issue Upton orders to embark on a round-the-world tour, taking pains to visit China, Japan, India, Russia, and several European nations to, quote, examine and report upon the organization, tactics, discipline, and maneuvers, end quote, of their armies. The War Department particularly instructed Upton to linger in Germany, to conduct a, quote, special examination of the schools for the instruction of officers in strategy, brand tactics, applied tactics, and the higher duties of the art of war, end quote. Upton and two brother officers sailed from San Francisco on August 3rd, 1875, and they returned to the United States 17 months later. Upton used his own funds to publish a book version of his report in April 1878 under the title, The Armies of Asia and Europe. This volume devoted most of its attention to describing the strengths and weaknesses of foreign armies, but Upton also included 54 pages of recommendations for changes aimed at improving the US Army and national military policy. For instance, he advised that the recruitment of troops should become a federal responsibility rather than a state one. During the Civil War, the states had shouldered that burden with all officers from second lieutenant to colonel being appointed by their governors or elected by their men, which infected the process of officer procurement with the corruption of political patronage or crass favoritism. Upton also advocated the adoption of a European promotion system, meaning lineal promotion by branch with accommodation for merit and not promotion by regiment based on seniority. In other words, open the doors for meritorious officers to advance quicker. In addition, Upton admired the European practice of having officers rotate between staff service and service with their respective combat branches. That ensured officers acquired an increasingly sophisticated sense of army management without losing touch with the troops and the challenges that confronted the latter in both garrison and the field. Inspired by the German system of advanced officer education, Upton also called for the creation of, quote, postgraduate institutions where meritorious officers from whatever sphere they may enter the army may study strategy, grand tactics, and all the sciences connected with modern war, end quote. Finally, Upton counseled that the regular army, which had been limited to a statutory size of 27,000 officers and men, be redesigned for quick expansion to 150,000. 
Upton argued that each of the Army's 25 infantry regiments should maintain a depot where on the outbreak of war, quote, one or two battalions of national volunteers, citizen soldiers, could unite with the two battalions of the regular regiment, end quote. The regular soldiers manning each depot would supervise the mobilization and training of national volunteers who would then be integrated into the regular army where they would be surrounded by veterans to set them an example and continue their conditioning into reliable soldiers. The armies of Asia and Europe sold less than 600 copies, which failed to communicate Upton's reforming zeal to the American public. Unwilling to admit defeat, Upton decided to write a second book, The Military Policy of the United States from 1775, which would draw on American military history to demonstrate the flaws in the Republic's military policy and provide a more compelling forum on how to fix it. Unfortunately, Upton did not live to accomplish that dream, plagued by painful headaches that were probably caused by a brain tumor. Upton shot himself in his quarters at the Presidio of San Francisco on March 14th, 1881. Among the dead man's effects was the unfinished manuscript to his book, which he had only managed to bring up through the Civil War's second year. Upton's friends saved his manuscript and they circulated it among reform-minded officers over the next two decades. The U.S. Army's bungling in the Spanish-American War led to the appointment of Elihu Root, a Wall Street lawyer as Secretary of War. Root entered office with a mandate for reform and like-minded Army officers exposed him to Upton's writings. In 1904, the War Department published the military policy of the United States and distributed it Army-wide. Among the most prominent of the so-called I mean, so root reforms was the establishment of a general staff system. At the laying of the cornerstone for the Army War College in 1903, Secretary Root proclaimed, were Upton alive today, he would see all of the great reforms for which he contended substantially secured. Without these and other changes, the U.S. Army would have made a substantially poorer showing a decade later during World War I, which finally weaned it from its traditional role as a frontier and imperial police force. Henceforth, the Army's leaders viewed their mission as defending the global interests of the world's leading economic power. That represented a fundamental shift that would have tremendous consequences for this country and many others, consequences that we continue to feel to this very day, and the impetus for the creation of the land force that would uphold the American century came from the American Civil War. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Irwin. So now that we've heard those two uh, opening statements, I want to. I, I have a couple questions, but I I open the floor to questions from you. But I'll while you all warm up, which with, with I hope with your interesting questions, I want to I want to ask both of our uh, both of our speakers, um, listening to both of you, right, we get the idea that the United States develops the way that it does through the experience of fighting the war, that the United States that went into the war was different than the one that came out, whether this is product of larger forces or whether it's product of, uh, of, uh, of internal dynamics, just of fighting, fighting long wars for a long time eventually creates certain institutions. But I am, I am curious, I will start with Professor McDougall on this, um, how aware were the two sides fighting the Civil War of the influence of the outside world while the war was going on? And how did they make that awareness felt and how they prosecuted the war? They could not have been more keenly aware mm -hmm. of the outside world and the possible influence of the outside world on their own conflict. No one, I think, I, I, I'm, I won't say no one, Professor Irwin will correct me if I say that, but almost no one uh, on either side in the at the beginning of the Civil War had any clue that it was going to be so terrible and last so long. Um, but nevertheless, despite that, uh, both the um, both Lincoln's cabinet and Jefferson Davis's cabinet and prominent um, figures on, on both sides realized right away that this conflict was going to be settled in an international environment mm -hmm. because the South strategy in the very beginning was, what did they do? They, they declared independence, 
and then they ended up having to fight a war for their independence. Gee, didn't we do that before in 1776? And so the South adopted essentially uh, the Washington strategy uh, in, uh, in the American War of Revolution, which is hold out, uh, tired, tired out the enemy, hope maybe sooner or later, hopefully the North will just give up trying to find to force its will on the South. But the way to do that is to try to get forward help. And the, North, the, the, uh, uh, the Northern cabinet obviously understood that as well, which is why William Henry Seward in particular, from the very start, was adamant to, as I say in my notes, deter, uh, persuade, uh, propaganda, guys, or otherwise keep the European powers at bay. Professor, when I want to take that question and twist it a little bit, right, is we have stories of uh, foreign observers at various battles at Gettysburg. Uh, do, what do we know about how the war was reported back to, say, the European capitals by what these observers had to say? Well, not just uh, military observers, but also uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Russell, uh, uh, as a William Howard Russell, I believe, who uh, made the na a name for himself reporting on the Crimean War. Mm -hmm. He's going to be mm -hmm. at first bull run. So the uh, the European press, especially the British press uh, and the French press, uh, were keenly interested in this uh, in this uh, conflict. Uh, it doesn't appear that the Europeans seem to feel that they had that much to learn from um, the, the American uh, military system. Um, and, and if they did, that's, 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 that's going to be wiped out by the, by the, the Prussian slash German victory in 1870, which, which puts, puts uh, uh, the German military uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the position as the one to be... Uh, the one to be copied, to be emulated. The Japanese fire their French military advisors and hire Germans after that. Um, but um, you know what's happening in America is is of, of deep interest in Europe because America is, you know, it's a rising economic power. By 1860, it's the fourth um, strongest industrial power in the world. The fact that. Uh, um, exported manufacturers equal the value of agricultural um, exports. Um, so for the British, who uh, especially felt uh, the pinch of American competition, seeing um, this war break out would, um, I, I, I imagine, be the way that um, if there were if there were upheavals in China that 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 shook its economic system that Americans might say, oh, excellent, you know, this is good. <laughs> it it, it sidetracks the, the yeah, competition there. Well, I, I am curious about the, the idea that of, you know, the Europeans saw what happened, but what did they do with it, right? As you described the Battle of Cold Harbor in 1864, which was a horrible example of soldiers charging fixed positions and getting mowed down. Heck, uh, Gettysburg charging Cemetery Ridge. Europeans watched that happen in 1864 and decided it was so interesting they would do it again in 1914, yeah, 1915, yeah. 1916. Well, I mean, uh, you know, for, for instance, the Europeans uh, launched um, successful frontal attacks against uh, entrenched enemies on, on even higher ground at the Alma uh, in the Crimea and Solofino uh, uh, during the fighting in 1859. I, I, uh, 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 an oft-repeated story is that uh, Moltke the Elder, the, the chief of staff of, of the Prussian uh, army, just dismissed uh, Civil War armies as untrained mobs. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're amateurs, and, and they, they're, they're not well-trained, they're not well-disciplined, they don't really understand the science of war, and this is why um, this thing has turned into such a terrible terrible bloodbath. It's very much the way Emory Upton viewed the Serbian militia when he uh, visited uh, that part of the world in, la in the latter 1870s and uh, was learning about the, the conflict between Serbia and Turkey um, and, and felt the only thing that really saved the Serbs were trained Russian officers coming in as military advisors. Um, but, uh, you know, they, these are just... So they, they, they just did not see anything comparison. Yeah. Walter? Uh, I was going to make the comparison to World War One, please. Uh, that uh, Europeans by 1863, 60, late 62, 63, I think most of your, almost all Europeans looked upon the American Civil War as an abomination. 
uh, uh, an atrocity and irrationality beyond all belief. Uh, what, what are they doing? You know, they're committing suicide here. This is crazy, which is exactly the reaction that Americans had about the, the bloodshed, uh, you know, the slaughter in, uh, in, in uh, World War I in Europe. Um, uh, but here, here's a quotation I found in my, in my book. Uh, the Times of London in 1864. The Americans are making war as no people ever made it before. Their campaigns combine the costliness of modern expeditions with the carnage of barbaric invasions. Grant squanders life like Attila the Hun and money like Louis XIV. <laughs> a, lot, a lot depended on, on the politics of, of the observer. Uh, upper crust British uh, observers tended to sympathize with the Confederacy. Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Fremantle, uh, whose diary would be printed, uh, he was in, in America in 1863. He came into the Confederacy and he's with the Army of Northern Virginia um, uh, at Gettysburg. And he's one of the more important sources for, for uh, looking at that battle. And he just found uh, uh, Southern gentlemen to be very much like British gentlemen. And he just liked these people and he was, he was rooting for them. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing. I mean, there were, there were a lot of different, different, I, be, I believe Graf Van Zeppelin came over uh, mm. and, uh, um, and, and observed the war as well uh, for the for the Prussian army. So there, I mean, but you know, a lot of these armies they see it as a business opportunity because uh, the United States and the Confederate States, even though the Union uh, could produce thirty two times as many guns as the Confederacy when the war began, neither side had the industrial capacity to arm and equip their armies immediately. Mm -hmm. Uh, it took the, the Union at least two years to really uh, develop that capacity. So both sides bought large quantities of surplus firearms mm -hmm. from the British, from the French, from the Prussians, from the Belgians. Um, and, and you find this wide away or array of weaponry, uh, along with dated American uh, weapons that were found in arsenals and up-to-date stuff uh, in the armies down, down into 18 into 1863, which created all kinds of nightmares because they had different calibers. British weapons were in the metric system and uh, trying to get the right ammunition to the right unit uh, just complicated things enormously. That's the main um, challenge. I, before we, uh, once again, I'll, before we uh, turn it over to, to all of you, one last question uh, from me. Uh, we talk about um, uh, US diplomacy, union diplomacy aims to limit foreign intervention. Uh, if we think counterfactually, what actual sort of intervention would have been possible slash likely in the context of the 1860s? I mean, are we just talking about the British might have decided to break the blockade yes. of the Confederacy? Yes, I believe that would be the most likely uh -huh. uh, intervention. At the very, even before, uh, was it even before Lincoln's inaugural? It was just after Lincoln's oh. inaugural. Um, Secretary of State William Henry Stewart um, uh, had just taken office and um, he began to do his duties consulting with European uh, emb embassies and, and whatnot. And he drafted a shocking memo for the president. Uh, it's famous in the historiography. It was called Some Thoughts for the President's Consideration. Very unassuming title. And he delivered it to Abraham Lincoln privately on April the 1st, April Fool's Day, as it happened, 1861. This is one of the most shocking documents in American uh, diplomatic annals. He, he, Seward, essentially said that the United States ought to declare war against any country anywhere in the world that dared to intervene or profit from in any respect the, the domestic American conflict. It was a wild, crazy document. And historians, various historians over the, over the, uh, uh, the uh, 160 or, so, or the 150 years have, uh, you know, come up with explanations why he panicked. William Henry Seward panicked. I don't think he was the, quite the stolid politician likely, likely to panic. He'd been governor of New York for, for two terms and Senate many years. Uh, he was one of the sturdiest statesmen in, uh, in America at the time. And as governor of New York, he had fiercely uh, enforced a non-intervention policy vis-a-vis -vis the domestic 
unrest in, in Canada in 1838, um, uh, a reversed situation. Uh, he, he absolutely refi uh, refused to allow citizens of the state of New York to run guns or sell supplies, not much less go volunteer to fight for the liberation of Canada from the British Empire. And now he was returning the favor in a sense um, uh, by asking the British to stay the hell out of, of our internal affairs. But what's this war business that he was that he that he that he, uh, he threatened against the Europeans? It was a bluff. A book has been written called Desperate Diplomacy, which I think got it right. It was an absolute flat out and had nothing going for it at the beginning of the war. No military force worth a damn. Uh, a naval blockade, it couldn't be, the Navy couldn't be, couldn't be, couldn't be force. Um, uh, it, 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 the, 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 uh, the, the Union cause uh, was desperate. And so Seward did the only thing he could do. He bluffed like crazy, like crazy, and he got away with it. Uh, and um, and the and uh, the proof of his of his Pacific intentions. He was not trying to be a warmonger. He was in fact trying to just keep the peace with the Europeans. Uh, occurred in 1862 with the Trent affair, or actually in December 1861, the capture of the, of the Trent, and then played out, um, uh, uh, in which the uh, um, Captain Charles Will, in fact, uh, in the USS San Jacinto, captured uh, a British. Uh, ship, a civilian ship, that was carrying two Confederate diplomats over to England to try to lobby for support for the Confederacy. Uh, and the British government, of course, was outraged that the U.S. Navy should have seized a British ship on the high, on the high seas. And it became a, a, probably the most, the most dangerous crisis in, uh, in the course of the whole Civil War. Uh, and there were many Amer 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 people in the cabinet and Northern Americans who said, don't give them, don't give the Slidell and Mason back their freedom. Uh, you know, by God, they're rebels and they deserve to be captured. To hell with the British. Seward was the one who argued in the cabinet for a face saving way out of the crisis. And indeed, Lincoln agreed to release the two Confederates without necessarily admitting that uh, Charles, Captain Wilkes had done anything wrong, just that he had exceeded his instructions. And that crisis ebbed, and then uh, ultimately, uh, of course, the British never did uh, intervene. Uh, but you know, that, that sort of, tell that gets the story straight on William Henry Seward. Captain Wilkes, you say? Charles Wilkes. Charles Wilkes, yeah, interesting. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting because the British, you know, we think that they're, they're, they're a free agent and, and, and they're what we would consider a superpower today and they could do anything they want. And which isn't the case any more than, than a nation as powerful as the United States can do anything it want. This is a country that has asserted the right to blockade mm -hmm. belligerents and for them to say, oh no, you know, you're not allowed to, to blockade the Confederacy. It's be uh, a dangerous press. That could be a dangerous break. Come back and bite them. Mm -hmm. uh, also, they have Canada. And if they, if there's war with the United States, they have got to militarize, they've got to fortify Canada. And this is a time in British history where par members of parliament are complaining about how much it costs to yeah. defend the empire. And, you know, there are a lot of white people in Canada and New Zealand and these other places. Let them raise the forces and we'll defend naval bases like Halifax right. and Singapore, but let's bring the troops home or, you know, we'll use them in India, but all these other places, there's no need for so many troops. So everybody's bluffing. Well, well, yeah, I mean, the British, they have to be judicious. Also, uh, you know, there's another power uh, that's eyeing the situation uh, uh, that the British and the French are wary of, especially the British in India, and that's Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russians will send a fleet to New York City in 1863 mm -hmm. as a show of friendship mm -hmm. for the United States. So, yeah, the British got the biggest, baddest Navy in the world at the time. But, you know, if you commit it, if you commit yourself in one part of the world, if you commit yourself in Iraq and Afghanistan, then what about North Korea? Indeed. If you commit yourself in North America, where things have never really worked out for the British, uh, 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 you know, uh, they were they were on something of a losing streak. Well, yeah, and, and, and America's much bigger. It's yeah. much more formidable, much more self-sufficient. Than it was back in in eighteen twelve or seventeen 
76. Let me ask a question uh, that so a word hasn't come up yet in our in our question and answer so far. What role did slavery play in the way that the outside world viewed? Because it's one thing for the British to say, man, we'd love all that cotton right. for our plants. But Britain at that time, of course, there was there was not necessarily a lot of enthusiasm for slavery. You know, Britain abolished slavery in 33 and and more or less, you know, Britain's the most modern and modernizing force in the world. That's how the British see themselves. So slavery is not cool anymore if you want to be modern. Yeah, right. It'd be like, uh, you know, so that was a big problem with supporting the Confederacy. It'd be like Nancy Reagan um, of, 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 of recent, recent memory, you know, after declaring don't say no, coming out and say legalize marijuana. You know? right. <laughs> so there's them. Yeah. So what, what, what about slavery? What about well, uh, uh, slavery was uh, um, uh, a serious drag, shall we put it, on, on Confederate propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the British middle and, and working classes were uh, pretty much dead set against Helping you know the slave power mm -hmm. um, continue its 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 rule, um, and it, it's hard to imagine Lord Palmerston, the Prime Minister during the Civil War, who was a fiery liberal ideologue, um, uh, supporting the South, um, uh, unless it was unless it was the 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 separation of the United States in two was considered a kind of a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that is what the British was kind of waiting to see. They 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 made the decision at the beginning of the war. Uh, they hated the blockade because it was phony. Mm -hmm. the, the, the European powers had just very recently uh, concluded a law, kind of a law of the sea treaty, that regulated blockades in time of war. Uh, and the uh, the very important rule was that a blockade has to be effective, to be legal. And it has to be an international war, not a civil war. And the, the American blockade in the early uh, years of the war met neither of those conditions. So what the Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln cabinet was doing by declaring this blockade was, in the eyes of European international law, illegal. And so the British did have a leg to stand on in protesting this blockade. Uh, but the British, uh, after the Trent affair, uh, Palmerston's cabinet kind of backed off and said, you know what? We'll let the Confederates sell their bonds on our exchanges, and we'll let our shipyards outfit raiders sh ships for the Confederate Navy. We'll sort of wink and let these uh, non-neutral activities go on in in the United, United Kingdom, but we otherwise we will declare our neutrality uh, and and essentially play a wait and see. If Lincoln, uh, if if the uh, if the um, if Lee had had won and get at Gettysburg, you know, then the, then the what if kicks in, right? Um, uh, and that's what makes the battlefield story of the Civil War so very important. When the when the war began, the Union Navy had ninety ships, only forty two of which were seaworthy, and only three were available for immediate blockade duty. Uh, now they're going to embark on a massive shipbuilding uh, campaign and also purchase lots of civilian ships and <clears throat> navalize them. By the end of the war, uh, the U United States Navy is the biggest in the 671 ships. Now the British Navy had a number of bigger warships, so we're, we weren't in a position to cross the Atlantic and try to defeat them in their waters. But our Navy was sufficient for coastal defense and the blockade was was 50% effective by the end of the war, which may not sound that impressive, but if you're only getting half the groceries you purchase, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. So if anybody, hands up for the question, we have uh, uh, Peyton Wendell will come with the with the microphone right here in front. Yes, gentlemen, sir, please. Would you comment on the American government's application or non-application of the Monroe Doctrine during a war, especially in regard to uh, Max Millions of Adventure in Mexico. Thank you. Maximilian and the Monroe Doctrine. I was, yeah. I was hoping somebody would ask that. Okay, well, obviously, uh, uh, obviously, the, the French gambit in Mexico uh, was a grotesque violation of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and uh, of course, the Europeans had never, 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 never recognized the Monroe Doctrine as a legitimate, uh, uh, you know, anything. I mean, it, it was not a treaty. It was not a uh, 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 an accord, or, um, you know, the Euro European governments had never, this is just some spread eagle, you know, high flute and boast by, um, you know, James, by, by, by President Monroe. 
you know, who, who does he think he is, a, a czar of Russia? Uh, that's the, that was the European attitude toward the Monroe Doctrine. And so, and the United States was not in a position to enforce the Monroe Doctrine, stri Monroe Doctrine strictly um, at any time prior to the Civil War. And it had only sort of, you know, gradually gotten legs in the American discourse that, well, we have this doctrine, you know, and what does it mean? We're not quite sure what it means, but it's, we think it's important that the Europeans stick, stay out of our neck of the woods. Uh, the, the Civil War, of course, was a great big test uh, of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and not just because of, uh, of uh, Emperor Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III's um, ga gambit or uh, grotesque violation of the Monroe Doctrine, uh, but because the French in involvement in Mexico grew out of very important um, situations. The one was domestic in Mexico. There was a royalist movement in Mexico. It was very powerful. And uh, by, uh, by um, uh, 1860s, it was in a position to, it, it hoped, overthrow the Republic and welcome uh, a, a monarch. Um, and what, man, what monarch might a Mexican government choose? Why a Habsburg monarch? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they did have several spares. Yeah, they did. You're yeah, right. That's right. Uh, and so the Mexicans themselves partly, um, you know, uh, uh, gave birth to this situation. Uh, and then, uh, which in the United States, how can the United States, can the, can the, could the United States, even if there were no civil war going on, uh, enforce the Monroe Donald Donald turn again? wishes of another another, another American uh, country. And then the second context was uh, the international one. Uh, the French uh, Navy and Marines had first arrived on the coast uh, of Mexico, Veracruz and whatnot, as part of an international force um, trying to, uh, uh, trying to uh, in, uh, enforce their will on the Mexican regime, which had reneged uh, on all of its debts uh, to European uh, banks. And so, um, and so there was, there was an international force went into Mexico to, you know, to uh, 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 oblige uh, the, the Mexicans to, um, to, to pony up their money. And then what happened was that the other powers went home and the Louis Napoleon decided, I think I'll let the French stick around and play, play ball with these royalists. And that is uh, that ultimately led to the invasion uh, uh, of uh, of in 1862, which gave birth to our American uh, uh, Madison Avenue uh, uh, artificial holiday called Cinco de Mayo. That celebrates the May 5th, 1862 Mexican victory over the invading French. Yeah. Yeah, I really yeah. about that. So, so the, a contribution to Pan American culture. That's right. right. There, there's, there's an irony. There's an irony in there. The, the United States Army, since the War of 1812, uh, and Winfield Scott's uh, work on the Niagara frontier, had uh, looked to the French Army, the Grand Army of Napo the First Napoleon, as as their model. And starting with with Scott, uh, the drill manuals that uh, were were adapted for the army down to the 1855 uh, William J. Hardy rifle light infantry tactics. That was the drill manual for both sides going to the Civil War. They were largely translations mm -hmm. of French army manuals. So there's kind of like looking up to the French. French when we formed our first permanent cavalry units in the 1830s, we sent young officers to the French cavalry school to see how they trained recruits and horses. But uh, there's Terrific outrage uh, when Louis Napoleon makes his grab for taking control of Mexico. The U.S. Army, though, came to gloat over this because uh, it, it remembered that in 1847, for, uh, 1847, it took Winfield Scott seven months to capture Mexico City with an army of under 10,000, whereas it took a French army of about 30,000, three, uh, three times as long, 18 months, and they suffered that defeat at Puebla. Oh. On the fifth of May. So uh, after the war comes, after the Civil War comes to an end, um, a lot of, uh, of of Union soldiers who were expecting to go home go to the Rio Grande. Yeah, Just large numbers of of, of 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 U.S. troops are set down. Two full cavalry divisions. Part of it just to make sure that the Texans understand the war is over. But yeah. it's also <laughs> Seward is now putting the pressure right. on Napoleon the Third. 
Uh, Mexico was also used as a way to kind of subvert the, the blockade. Fortunately, uh, for the Union, carrying things overland through northern Mexico into Texas was not easy. Uh, but And once the Confederacy was cut in half, the efficacy of that uh, of that uh, backdoor uh, it affected less of the Confederacy. But yeah, there, there, there were there was that was a sore spot. I bet it was. All right, a question from the audience. Yes, please. I might be wrong, or not everyone would agree. But the issues that we really may ignore, or a geopolitical issue that came from the Civil War, was what became called the American way of war which was kind of adopted by the rest of the world for a long time and maybe still is in many places where there's massive firepower, lots of casualties, uh, lots of civilian deaths. Mm. And probably up until after Vietnam and maybe later in other parts in Europe especially, we've kept that. And that didn't occur before the Civil War. Well, I, this is a good question about the the uh, when people criticize Grant for being uh, profligate, right? Napoleon was pretty profligate at Bagram in uh, 1809. Um, so he might claim to have been earlier in his career all about maneuver, but after a while, you just bang away at the other side until they until they give up. Uh, was there a sense that what, if we, we already know that they, that Europeans thought that Grant was uh, insufficiently uh, stylish in his warfare, but did they think <laughs> that was something that was particularly American? Well, my predecessor at Temple University, Russell F. Wigley wrote the book, The American Way of War, came out in 1973. It was part of his outraged reaction to the way we mishandled the war in Vietnam militarily. Mm -hmm. And he would argue that that the, the, the Civil War became the template for the U.S. Army. And the idea is, you know, you find the enemy's main force and you throw everything you got at them. You seek a climactic battle and you keep hammering, you keep hammering until the enemy is subdued. And he says that, that that's the thinking that influenced American commanders in Europe during World War II and that it carried on into other conflicts as well. Certainly, the Civil War cast a long shadow in the training of, of American officers during the, the, the 20th century. I mean, they, they looked at Napoleon, but the Civil War was big, too. Uh, Hap Arnold, yeah. who uh, you know, was one of the, the people who created the U.S. Army Air Forces, and he was uh, on the, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was Marshall's, George Marshall's deputy chief of staff for air. He used to he complain, you know, we go to these advanced schools, and we're dealing with Civil War battles, and we're reading manuals on pack mules, and he's air minded. He's like, "What is? How is? How is? How is?" So to him, the Civil War was was something to throw off. Uh, Sir Basil Liddell Hart, uh, the British military theorist, who uh, you know after World War One said, "We can't do that again. We've got to come up with a, a new way to win wars." He will look to William Tecumseh Sherman, and Sherman. Waging what during Sherman, 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 Sherman's time was not called total war, but hard war, going you know targeting enemy civilians, not not killing them like like we would do in strategic bombing, but terrorizing them by destroying any property that might be of use to the enemy, including well your horses you got a wagon here then we might take that we're gonna we're gonna take it or we're gonna destroy it and um, often Sherman's men exceeded his orders but he said. They started it. I don't want to hear. The uh, only thing I want to hear from them is we give up. Uh, now, uh, some people say that 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 this targeting of, of civilians uh, put us on 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 the on the the treacherous slope down to completely removing civilian immunity in warfare and you know right. strategic bombing. <laughs> Targetation because civilians are soft. If we hit them hard enough and kill enough of them, they will rebel. They will force their governments to surrender. And we saw how badly that way it's worked. It's killed a lot of people. But, you know, yeah, it didn't, it didn't get the British to collapse. Didn't get the Germans to collapse. And 9-11 didn't get them. Guess. Hap Arnold, uh, the favorite son of Gladwell, Pennsylvania, I might add. There we go. Very, very good thing to know. Another question from the audience, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It seems to me that the biggest international losers in this whole affair were the guys in the slave trading business, which I believe was mostly the Ottoman Empire. Did they have a say in any of this? 
Well, uh, the the slave trade, of course, in the United States had been uh, had been uh, outlawed as of what 1806. The British had pretty much put a clamp on it. Uh, this goes back to the idea of you know what happens right. to slavery as an economic force, right? As we as the the fighting, obviously, slavery is maintained in Brazil, yep. right, for another decade or so. But yep. uh, but the the, de the defeat of the Confederacy and the abolition of slavery in the U.S. is a you know, knocks out one of the last large slave economies. In the yes, world. it does. Yeah. Well, there are only really in the Western world three uh, major slave holding areas, United States and then Cuba and, and Brazil. Right. But I mean, the, the British outlawed in 33 and then they maintain a squadron off the, a naval squadron off the West Coast of Africa. And the United States, I believe, joined the joint the in the 1830s. Right. Uh, so, you know, there, there are smugglers just like in the drug trade today. I mean, there are tales and anecdotal tales of people coming across slaves during the Civil War who don't speak English. Right. Kind of but uh, I don't. I don't know if the international slave trade, as far as bringing slaves to North America, if that was that strong of an industry by by the time of the Civil War. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Walter, last uh, last comment. Uh, the Ottoman Empire. I don't, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't know of any. I don't know of any intervention or issue that, uh, regarding the American Civil War that involves the Ottoman Empire. I, they, I'm sure they had some kind of a policy. The sultans would have been aware of this and all the rest. But slavery in the uh, in the Middle East, uh, mostly East African uh, slavery uh, uh, among the Arabs, uh, mostly for you know domestic uh, service. Um, there had been plantations on Cyprus. That, in fact, the, the whole Atlantic slave culture began thanks to the Ottoman Empire. It migrated from the Eastern Mediterranean across to the Western Mediterranean. The Spaniards and the Portuguese picked it up uh, in places like the Azores Islands and whatnot, and then it ultimately all got translated to the New World. But the the, the, the Middle Eastern Middle story of human bondage and the Anglo or the uh, Euro-American story of, uh, of, of uh, human bondage got, you know, separated. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't think there was any connection. Good. Well, we are just about, uh, we are just about out of time, I am afraid, right? It's already seven o'clock. Do you believe that? We had a, a very nice conversation. I want to thank our guests. <laughs> yes, right, right. And I want to thank I want to thank all of you. I want to say uh, just one quick thing, and that is this kind of conversation is the sort of thing we like to do at FPRI. If you are not already a friend or a fan of FPRI, we urge you to come join us for future conversations, future discussions. Uh, follow us on Facebook, friend us, uh, or follow us on Twitter, friend us on Facebook. Download the FPRI app. Uh, uh, to check out the events that we that we run, um, we are delighted you could join us tonight. On behalf of on behalf of One Book One Philadelphia, on behalf of the Stanley and Arlene Ginsburg Lecture Series, on behalf of the National Liberty Museum, and on behalf of FPRI, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Good night, everybody. Welcome to this installment of the Asia Program and the China Center's uh, series of talks on contemporary issues in Asia. Today we have with us Scott Moore, uh, the author of the new book, China's Next Act, which will be talking uh, with us uh, about today. Uh, it's uh, The full title is China's Next Act, How Sustainability and Technology Are Reshaping China's Rise and the World's Future. Uh, Scott is a valued colleague of mine here at Penn, in addition to uh, writing that book and another book. Uh, the Subnational Hydropolitics, it came out a few years ago. Uh, his work appears in China Quarterly, Foreign Affairs, New York Times, Nature, and other journals. Uh, today, he these days, he is a, the director of the China Program and Strategic Initiatives at Penn Global, where he oversees the Global Research and Engagement Program and leads strategic initiatives for the Vice Provost uh, for Global Initiatives at Penn. He also teaches uh, topics and courses in Chinese politics here, uh, and uh, in his spare time, manages to, to to crank out this kind of of, of scholarship as well so it's, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome 
uh, Scott here. Let me just set up a couple of uh, ground rules uh, um, for uh, the uh, session that we're having. For those of you who join us frequently, you know the drill, which is uh, Scott gets half an hour plus a bit to uh, lay out the arguments and the content of his books. If you want uh, to participate in the conversation, please put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat function. Um, and we will get to those in due course. We'll weave them into our conversation. So without further ado, let me just say two more things, uh, which uh, are uh, that, um, it, that these programs, which we are delighted that you join us for, whether they're on Zoom, which they have been lately, or in person, which we hope to be going back to soon, especially with FPRI's new offices, uh, they're free to you, but they're not free to us. I'm grateful if you would join FPRI or donate to FPRI. Uh, and one more item to plug is that the pen, the future of U.S. China Relations, of which FPRI's Asia program is a co-sponsor, will be doing a public session two weeks from today at 12:30 at Perry World House. Uh, a bunch of folks that you've seen uh, in our sessions will be here, including Scott. Uh, will be there for for at least part of the day, uh, but there will be a public session again from 12:30 to two at Perry World House on the Penn campus. So I've taken up way too much time, including with the glitch, uh, not unmuting at the start. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Scott Moore. Thanks so much, uh, Jacques, and thanks so much to uh, the Asia Program uh, and the uh, China Center at uh, FPRI. Um, it's a, a particular pleasure to uh, have uh, this kind of get, get to speak to uh, hometown uh, audiences, though thanks to uh, the pandemic, uh, I'm cognizant that uh, many may be joining from well uh, outside um, uh, Philadelphia, all, all, also, uh, of course, a real pleasure. Um, so I'm a big fan of giving uh, folks the bottom line up front. Uh, and so here it is with respect to uh, my new book, China's Next Act. We should really be thinking about China's rise, U.S.-China relations, and engagement with China more generally in terms of two areas that we haven't thought as much about in the past. Uh, and those two are uh, sustainability, uh, which uh, includes uh, public health uh, and pandemic prevention, as well as climate change and other environment, and emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and biotechnology. And the reason I think it's so important that we focus our thinking uh, and our action and our policy about China uh, and uh, China's rise in the world is both because uh, our future is increasingly uh, clouded by major challenges, uh, both in the fields of sustainability and emerging te technology, but also because developments in those two areas are reshaping a lot of the more traditional areas uh, of focus in US-China relations and in China's uh, relationship with the world. Um, some examples and, and things we'll talk more about uh, are uh, uh, issues and tensions over Taiwan, for example. Uh, it's very hard to speak about those uh, without at least there are many other uh, examples, and of course, I'll say more about that um, in the slides to come. Let me first back up, though, and say a little bit more about uh, why I wrote this book. Um, and it really has to do with an experience that I had um, about a decade ago, uh, and I had the chance through a, a, a fellowship uh, to spend uh, some time at the U.S. Department of State on the China desk, the office that handles U.S.-China US relations, with a, a portfolio or a, a job responsibility uh, called Environment, Science, Technology, and Health. Um, I had just come out of uh, graduate school uh, and doing a postdoc. And so especially uh, coming from academia where, uh, as, as uh, you all know, the focus is really on relentless specialization um, and being handed a, a job that uh, uh, had all of these different areas combined in it, uh, seemed somewhere between laughable and maybe even downright dangerous to expect uh, one single person uh, to kind of keep track of and handle all of these very different areas, uh, from climate change to uh, satellite orbits to nuclear waste. Um, but over the period that I was there, uh, that kind of set of responsibilities became uh, a little bit less uh, uh, of an eccentricity, which is how it, it uh, first to me, um, as uh, a lot of these issues, and in particular climate change, became really central uh, to U.S.-China relations. Uh, I happened to be there in uh, the year leading up to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change uh, in 2015. And in that period, 
climate change rocketed from uh, an important but uh, some still somewhat peripheral issue in U.S.-China relations uh, to one of, if not the most important issue in U.S.-China relations. And it was so important uh, that uh, uh, I found myself, and here's where the picture uh, that you see there comes into play, uh, being basically drafted uh, uh, into uh, attending the Paris Agreement talks really just to keep track of the sheer number of meetings that were taking place uh, between U.S. and China officials as part of the agreement. Uh, many of those meetings were very high level. Um, the gentleman that you see uh, with his hand sort of awkwardly on my shoulder there is then Secretary of State uh, John Kerry. Um, uh, I should maybe fess up to the context of this uh, photo, which is that uh, uh, shortly before this photo was taken, I've been casually reading the newspaper that you see uh, me holding there uh, when uh, the secretary came into our office there, uh, came right over to me uh, and said something to the effect of, I thought you all were supposed to be working, uh, which accounts for some of the nervous laughter uh, that you see there too. Um, but the point is uh, that I was there um, really because of uh, the intensity of very high level diplomacy going on between the U.S. US and China, and just how important climate change became to U.S.-China relations. Um, and I hasten to add that, um, that climate change wasn't the only example of sort of newer or non-traditional areas um, where uh, uh, there, there seemed to be so much promise for U.S.-China relations. Another was uh, public health. And uh, this 2015 was uh, preceded by what was at the time thought to be a very successful example of U.S.-China cooperation in response to uh, a serious outbreak of Ebola in West Africa in 2014-2015. And what this all added up to was uh, a real sense uh, that I shared, and I think many of my colleagues at, the, at, at, le at least the State Department shared at the time, which was that not that only were the United States and China capable of working together to address shared global challenges uh, in the realm of environmental sustainability, but also that doing that might allow us to lay the foundation for a more constructive relationship going forward. And it's worth kind of briefly noting that even at that time, U.S.-China relations were pretty rocky. Um, climate change was a real exception, and public health was a real exception. And we really um, felt that uh, uh, that uh, by working together on those issues, that we could make some progress, not just on those issues themselves, but also um, the broader relationship and China's uh, role in the world. Well, we all know how that turned out over the last uh, decade or so, uh, and that vision uh, more or less failed, at least for now. Uh, and that leads me to... Uh, the goals that I set out for this book, um, first of all, to just try to tie together and present a picture of what China's role actually looks like in tackling these shared global challenges, uh, both in sustainability and emerging technology, to at least offer a couple of explanations for why this vision um, that so many of us shared and this promise that seemed so, uh, uh, so great uh, has largely failed, um, especially um, in uh, preventing or addressing uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and third and finally, but most importantly, to try to uh, think of some ways how we can make progress um, despite uh, the growing tension and rivalry between uh, the U.S., China, and other countries. Um, just to kind of briefly lay out, there are four things we're going to hear about um, in this presentation and that I talk about um, a little bit more at length uh, in the book. Um, and I want to briefly go through them. Uh, I've already talked about shared ecological challenges and, and emerging technologies as being sort of the, the key issues that I uh, address in the book. Um, and the reason that I think those are really important to look at alongside each other um, is that developments in those two areas are really reshaping so much uh, of, uh, 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 of the global future as well as key elements of U.S.-China relations, China's relationship with other countries um, as well. Um, and I also talk about uh, these two concepts of uh, competition and cooperation, um, especially when we think about those shared ecological challenges. We tend to think about uh, those as things that require cooperation. You can't address climate change without cooperation um, um, between the U.S. Uh, and China. Um, on the other hand, 
emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, we often think about uh, development of those technologies as being sort of a comp competition, or at least involving some degree of competition between the US, China, and other major uh, countries. Um, but actually, I think uh, it's, it's important to kind of break down uh, those, uh, those definitions. And in fact, uh, there are ways in which competition can be helpful uh, in addressing issues like climate change, while on the other hand, uh, we do need a lot of cooperation when it comes to uh, dealing with urgent. Weave through an understanding of how uh, both shared ecological challenges and emerging technologies relate to these concepts of competition and cooperation that we talk so much about when it comes to China. And just to say that I, I try to fill in um, the gaps there. Um, a concept that I developed throughout the book that I think has helped all of all of these issues in relation to each other um, is called the risk society. And that's a concept that a German sociologist named Ulrich Beck um, came up with uh, back in the 1980s. He enjoyed sort of a brief um, period of, of uh, uh, pseudo celebrity in the early uh, phases of the pandemic when folks like Adam Tooze, a well-known historian and public intellectual, um, kind of uh, publicized some of his writing. Um, but the key thing about uh, Beck and this concept of the risk society um, is that he argued that um, increasingly societies are uh, shaped and defined by um, existential risks, especially those that emanate from uh, environmental or ecological changes, um, and that those tend to be very threatening and, 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 and very destabilizing, um, not only for uh, societies, but also uh, politics. It's very difficult for governments to address these existential risks, um, and that tends to have a very, um, uh, 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 a very complex um, and often a very uh, 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 negative effect um, on, uh, on society's politics and economics. And I think that's a really useful way to think about some of how uh, society has developed um, over the last few years, especially as it begins to emerge um, from, from the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's worth underscoring, though we've seen a lot of depictions of this um, in the media, that while the COVID-19 pandemic uh, disrupted life everywhere, um, it almost certainly has not disrupted life uh, anywhere as much as China, with uh, possibly the exception of some extreme cases, cases like North Korea. Um, it's hard to overstate uh, the cumulative effect of lockdowns, the um, uh, uh, increasing prevalence of surveillance and tracking that was instituted to, 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 to during the COVID-19 pandemic and of course the knock-on effect uh, with respect to uh, economic growth, trade, lots of other things from the COVID-19 pandemic fundamentally reshaped uh, Chinese society uh, and, and its economy. Um, but it's also uh, the case that other ecological risks have increasingly uh, reshaped China's uh, economy and its politics, uh, arguably just as much. Uh, and that's certainly true uh, of climate change. The photo that uh, I show here on the right uh, is from the summer of 2021. Uh, that was the second consecutive summer that China uh, was subject to record-breaking droughts. Uh, I'm sorry, record-breaking floods um, that resulted, among other things, in uh, this photo from the Zhengzhou subway, uh, an incident in which about 500 people were trapped underground uh, and a few dozen people uh, tragically uh, died. I could just as easily have uh, shown a photo from just this past summer in which much of the same part of central China was subjected uh, not to record-breaking floods, but record-breaking droughts um, that were so severe uh, that they uh, caused most economists uh, to uh, downgrade uh, China's growth prospects for the year on top of COVID-related uh, disruptions. So again, increasingly the case that we're seeing uh, ecological factors and developments in the ecological sphere really reshape a lot of China's politics, its economics, and its society. That's also true, though, uh, not just of ecological risks, 